Kessington School. A particular warm welcome to all those members of the public who's with us tonight. Um, it's lovely to see so many people um, battle against the storm this afternoon and this evening. And um, to those watching the meeting online, so we're live streaming. My name is Councillor Lorraine Dunstane and I'll be chairing this committee this evening. In the event of emergency and the sounding of an alarm, the emergency evacuation procedure is to leave by the nearest exit. Anyone requiring assistance should remain in their seats and you'll be assisted from the building. Whilst formal restrictions are not in place, I would ask everyone present to be mindful of close proximity to each other and to wear a face covering unless an exemption applies. Um, when we're speaking into the microphones, we'll take our masks off just so that you can hear us because I think it gets a bit muffled otherwise when you're trying to speak. Um, anyone in the public gallery or watching at home who wishes to follow the agenda from their tablet or smartphone can do so by going to www.kingston.gov.uk and following the links from your council on the home page and clicking on decision making and consultations and surveys. This meeting is being filmed for live broadcast on the Council's YouTube channel and archived versions will be available to view on the channel as the meeting finishes. The broadcast will be suspended during any adjournments in proceedings and if the committee resolves to consider information as exempt business. Members are reminded that microphones must be switched on and spoken into clearly for the broadcast. If I can ask that um, anyone speaking into the microphone actually speaks directly into it rather than moving around because it's difficult to, to pick up the recording and, and uh, for some people to hear. Please can everyone present in the meeting also ensure their mobile phones are switched off or in silent mode for the duration of this meeting. I will start by introducing the, man, the members of this planning subcommittee, and I'll go around the room. Uh, Councillor Margaret Thompson. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Councillor Christine Stewart. Thank you for coming. I'm Councillor Christine Stewart, and I'm from Chessington South Ward. Councillor Andrew McKinley. Andrew McKinley from Chessington South Ward. And I'm from uh, Tolworth and Hook Rise Ward. We also have, pre um, have officers here present this evening who will be um, presenting reports. So I'll go first to apologies. Um, Fiona, do we have any apologies for absence? Yes, sir. we have apologies Thank you. And please may I sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of February 2021 as a correct record. Agreed. Thank you. I'll sign those after the meeting. Um, declarations of interest. Members are asked to declare any dispose, disclosable pecuniary interests and any other non-pecuniary interests, i.e. personal interests, relevant to items on the agenda. Do members have any declarations of interest? <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to go first on to the uh, planning consultation of um, 1 to 5 King Edwards Drive, Chessington. This planning application has been brought to South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee for comment prior to determination at a future planning committee, um, if the officer um, recommend, recommendation is for approval in accordance with the council's scheme of delegation. The process we will follow for this item is that the applicant's team will provide a 15 to 20 minute presentation on the scheme, which will be followed by question and answer session from members of the public and councillors. I understand we have Damien Wood from Frontier, who's the applicant, Hugo Fitzgerald, Broadway um, Mal sorry, Malayan architect, and Heather Lindley Clapp, Nexus Planning from the planning agent. Is that correct? Thank you. Good evening. So I'm going to ask um, councillors if we wish to, um, and also if um, Barry, if you wanted to move over to seats over there so you can see the, um, the presentation. So if that's okay, so I'll pass that over to, so if the applicants team want to come along and present the item. Sure. 
Steinen. Oh. Mood light. <coughs> Uh, <laughs> a, little, a little more There's light would be great. Yeah. 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 That's better. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to see different? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening and uh, welcome to everyone and thank you very much for allowing us to speak and address the committee this evening. Um, we are the uh, project team for the um, proposed care home at King Edward Drive in Chessington. So the purpose of tonight's presentation is to provide an overview of the site, the planning and principle of development. Um, we will then run through the design drivers behind the scheme and um, in particular, look at um, particular aspects in terms of the residential amenity layout principles and the proximity and massing with adjacent properties, both on Hook Road and, um, and, and other surrounding um, areas around the, the application site. We'll also concentrate on access and parking, as we fully understand that that is an important aspect of the proposal, and then go into a little bit about environmental design and sustainability. So the site, as we know, is um, located um, off Hook Road and it um, comprises numbers one to five of King Edward's Drive. They are five detached um, residential dwellings with um, uh, associated gardens and um, boundaries. To the north and the south of the site are a number of trees and hedging and we'll go into a bit more detail about the, um, the, the trees, in particular the protected trees on the site, later on in the presentation. What's important is that the um, five dwellings are currently accessed off King Edward Drive, which itself is accessed off Hook Road. So the next couple of slides just set out um, some of the key planning and, um, and principle of development um, considerations in um, thinking about the, the, the application here. Now, importantly, the application site is situated within the settlement boundary as um, defined by the adopted development plan. There is a clear and pressing need both within local planning policy and national planning policy for elderly care and care home bed spaces. Now this is particularly um, apparent within Chessington and as we again will go into more detail later on in the presentation, we have um, a signed um, operator who is very keen to um, uh, occupy and, and, and occupy the, the proposed care home at the application site. There is a demonstrated need for this care home in Chessington. We acknowledge that the proposal will see the loss of five dwellings, but the proposed development for the care home will see an intensification of use in a sympathetic um, proposal which will accommodate over 70 um, elderly um, patients within the building. There are also wider benefits which include freeing up other housing in the borough and also um, reducing care costs for the NHS um, by providing on-site provision um, of care. We've also set out here some of the other wider benefits and considerations that have been taken account of in proposing, in, the, in drawing together the proposal. Now, it's important to note that this application is in outline at the moment, and while some design aspects which we will cover in the next few slides have been considered and have been thought about, that detailed design element of the scheme will be developed as we work through the proposal into the next stages. So what we are seeking here is the principle of, of the development on the site. We will work together with the local authority and the wider stakeholders to 
provide for a development which which recognises the context around the application site and takes account of the scale and massing of surrounding uses. We've got an opportunity here to deliver a scheme of very high quality and high sustainability standards. And we, again, we will provide further detail of that at the end of this presentation. The site is an accessible location. It is in with walking distance of bus stops and we have provided the necessary amount of car parking spaces um, for staff, for senior staff, and for visitors. And again, we'll, we'll cover this in, in more detail shortly. The proposal seeks to retain all protected trees. It will see the loss of some of the lower quality trees, but does provide for a number of additional trees and other landscaping um, aspects across the site. The proposal will also deliver long-term jobs and investment into the local economy. Both full and part-time job opportunities will be created through construction and through operation of, of the development. Thank you, Heather. Um, although, as Heather um, pointed out there, this is an outline application, we just wanted to take you through some of the early design drivers that we've started to look at should we go to a detailed application. Um, looking at the site as a, as a very basic SWOT analysis, uh, things to note is the site topography. Um, Hook Road sits a couple of metres above the western boundary of our sites. Um, King Edwards Drive itself sits a little bit lower than Hook Road and the topography falls away as it moves west. Um, the verdant setting of the proposals was something of particular note for us, particularly on the areas of the boundaries, where there are a number of TPO trees that we um, will retain as part of any proposals moving forward. Um, the access points uh, from Hook Road running along King Edwards Drive, the principle of that we're retaining as existing, and, and although there will be, we hope to propose a realignment, the concept of the access and egress is very similar. Um, <clears throat> and the other main driver was the proximity to the road and the neighbours to the west of the site, but also on the other side of Hook Road to the east, and how the relationship and massing relates to, to both Hook Road and the Kelvin Grove res residents. Thank you. Looking at the layout principles for the parameter plans, um, we're basically following the same, same principles as the existing dwellings on the site, um, namely that there's a ribbon of development running from north to south of the site predominantly, and it is wrapped in amenity uh, for the residents of the property, which allows us to create a buffer on the west of the site, Kelvin Grove, but also on the east of the site, we're placing the, any vehicular movement and storage in parking um, and using that as a bit of a buffer for the residents of our proposals from the Hook Road. Thank you. Um, building proximity, again, something that we've looked at closely as to where we place the building. Um, and there's a, a comfortable distance from residents, the, the adjacent residents on um, Kelvin Grove, um, and we'll also demonstrate how we step the massing down towards that residential scale um, as the building moves east. Um, the other point to make note of is, as I said earlier, we're retaining all the existing mature landscape um, that wraps the boundary of the site, and in fact, reinforcing and enhancing that as well. Thank you. Um, again, looking at proximities, this is a, a, a basic section study um, through the Hook Road and beyond. On the top, section AA takes you through the front of the building to the parade um, on Hook Road and then moving west across to the Kelvin Grove. And you can see how the proposals uh, plan to reduce the scale of the building to two storeys at the back to relate to the 
um, residential properties, but then it steps up towards Hook Road for two reasons. One, the fact that it's responding to what's going on uh, on the other side of the road, of the Hook Road, with both the um, existing apartments and also the uh, <coughs> resident, the retail centre, but also the fact that the building sits down on the site. It needs to have a, a level of stature so that it responds to the, the, the scale of the Hook Road and the busyness of the Hook Road. Thank you. Access, um, we're proposing to keep the access um, as is existing, although we hope to realign the King Edward Drive to allow for a, a wider area for pedestrian movement adjacent to Hook Road to make it a more comfortable experience, but also to give us the opportunity to add landscape and make that journey a more, um, a more pleasant place to be, really. Thank you. <clears throat> um, cycle and parking, um, just briefly to say what's accommodated on the site. We're proposing uh, 20 parking spaces uh, with two disabled, four electric, but all the spaces will be have the infrastructure so that more electric points can be put in as that moves forward. And 28 bike spaces of which uh, 24 are provided for staff. Um, it's worth pointing out that uh, the occupiers, uh, the occupier that we're looking at has some 20 odd, 200 odd homes across the UK. And through their research, they ask us to allow for one per six rooms for visitor spaces, um, which works out to about 12. And then the remainder of the spaces will be overflow visitors and some are left for senior staff, but the majority of the staff um, have bus, local minibus provided by the occupier to get them to site. So it's minimal parking for use on site. Thank you. Um, and this is just, as I say, it's an outline application, but we're just starting to look at how we can break down the building into sort of more residential scales in splitting the building into different households, which reflects the households inside the building, but also reflects the idea of a series of, t of townhouses within the urban landscape. Thank you. Um, materials, again, although this is really a detailed application stage, we're, we've already been asked to start looking at it just in terms of the quality of the material, traditional materials, again, to reflect the residential area that it sits within. Predominantly stone, we're looking at a stone plinth with traditional brick above, br um, tile, clay tile roofs with the, perhaps the introduction of some high quality metal areas to give it a contemporary feel, albeit high quality. Again, this is just an illustrative view looking from the other side of Kelvin Grove back at the, at the um, development. And I think what it demonstrates is how well it sits within the, the urban environment with the um, local shops opposite it, a very similar scale to what we're proposing on site and the width and scale of the Hook Road, which we're trying to balance with the building. Thank you. Um, environmental design. Um, through Again, through the detailed stage, we'll be developing this further, but the occupiers and the developers these days, we don't look so much to Briam these days because Briam doesn't really give you the quality of environmental design that we can actually put into the building. We look far more at the, um, the fabric first solution, which is high quality insulation and fabric to the building. So you'd need to put less energy into the building to keep it the comfortable environment. We look at renewables, air source heat pumps, um, <coughs> and various other gray water reharvesting. And uh, it's something that we'll develop much further as we go into detailed stages of the, of the development. And I think that was it for questions.
we stay or do we go? Doing. I don't know what the situation is now. I don't know whether it's Q&A now or... Does anyone else have some questions? See. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes, if you want to take a seat, and uh, if we need to, we'll, we'll call you back if that's all right. Um, Barry, um, do you have any initial comments at all on that presentation? Okay, lovely. Thank you. So we have a number of pu public speakers on the item. Um, I've got green sheets. If anyone else has got any, any that they want to hand in, then please, um, please do. Um, and I'll call each resident in turn, if you'd like to come down to, um, to the microphone, uh, give us your name, um, and then let us have your comments and thoughts. Um, so I'll pass to Sue Towner, first of all. Do you want me to... I want to comment on this one. Oh, right, okay. The other ones are planning decision meetings, and you'd have to pre... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Rob. It is for the two decision items, as I mentioned before. The two decision items later on will be the five normal planning. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris Rand, did you want to come forward? Thank you very much. Evening. My name is um, Chris Rand. I'm a resident of Kelvin Grove, along with some of my fellow neighbours here tonight. And we've sat through that presentation and um, don't quite know where to start, to be honest. Um, I'll start with the sheer size of it, the scale of it. It's far too big, it's imposing, it will be a scar on the, the area that we live in. And if it's so nice, perhaps our colleagues here from various suppliers to this care home supplier would like a building like this built at the top of their road. Because it really is, actually looking at it here tonight on that picture, it really brings it home just how big it, it is. And I think, I think it's fair to say that if, if someone wanted to build a care home on that site and it was a reasonable size, and, and when I say reasonable size, I mean probably half the amount of bedrooms that um, they're proposing at the moment, which is 76. If it was a reasonable size and it had access in and out on King Edward Drive and it didn't it didn't break into Kelvin Grove, which is a road that we live in, which is a nice road. It's a tree line road. And, and, and for, it to, for them to, to, to design it so they, they break into our road, I, I think, I think it's, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. Um, and if it was, a, like I said, if it was a reasonable size, uh, I, put, I can't speak for my fellow neighbours, but I don't think I would have too much of a problem with it. You know? But... In its present form, I just think it's far too big. 76 rooms in that building. Now, I have some experience of care homes because my mother lived in a care home for two and a half years. And I know the care home at Moore Place in Isha. That's a big site. It's huge. And that's, uh, that's 60 bedrooms. And that's a much bigger building and a much bigger site than this. Um, so that gives you some sort of comparison, really. Um, in its present form, um, I must mention the parking. Uh, 20 parking spaces is really not enough. Uh, and, and for them to say that there's 28 bike racks or whatever, I mean, it makes it sound like it's going to be like Call the Midwife in 1950s East, East End of London. I mean, it's laughable, really. Um, 
the, the people that work there, I mean, I don't know how many staff they're going to have. I, I don't remember now. Um, but a lot of them will, will probably drive to the site. And 20 spaces is not enough when you've got all the carers and you've got all the managers and all, everything else and all the visitors and all the suppliers. And where will they park? The nearest road to the, car, to the care home, which is Kelvin Grove, which is where we live. And, and you know, so we're going to be inundated with car parking, probably parking over our drives, making it difficult to get in and out of our houses. And I think that's a major consideration. And it wouldn't, because, this, because it's so big and there'd be so many visitors and so many staff, it won't be just Kelvin Grove, it will be all surrounding roads as well. And I would say that if this company wants to build a care home of this size, there is a, to me, I'm not a planning expert, but to me, there's a perfect site across the A3 on the old um, Cap in Hand public house. That, that to me is a, is a good site, it's a, it's a large site, it's got a lot of parking, and you could build up, and you could probably have that building there. And again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain about that. <laughs> It'd look a lot better than the, uh, the building that's there right now, I can tell you. Um, um, so the, the fact that they break into Kelvin Grove is obviously a big thing for us because it's, it's, it's imposing on our everyday lives. And um, I, I would also say, um, I'm not a, as I said, I'm not an expert on, on this, but um, the policy of Kingston Council is that they resist planning application when it involves the taking away of residential um, houses. And um, this does that. And I don't know if, uh, if the people, if they, if they were to build a, a, a care home there, I don't know how many people from Chessington would, would reside in that care home. Because, you know, when you look for a care home, when I looked for a care home for my mother, I looked in Kingston, New Malden, and my, my, my mumster ended up in Weybridge and New Malden. Um, excuse me, can I take a drink? Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's really, really the fact that it, it's, it's such a big building and, and it's not in keeping uh, with, with the local area. Um, it, Kelvin Grove is a nice road. King Edward Drive is actually a very nice road with very nice houses built by Thoroughgood builders who built um, Elmcroft Drive in the 1930s. Um, and it's a very nice residential area. Okay, it's got the Hook Road, which is busy, but, but you know, you go down the road, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice road and it will be scarred. And our lives will be, will be much the worse for this development in its present form. Uh, like I said, if it was if it was maybe a bit smaller, I, I personally wouldn't have, and it didn't break into Kelvin Grove, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chris. Really appreciate you coming forward and uh, and speaking. So if you'd like to take your okay. seat, I'll ask somebody else to come up as well. Um, Nigel Jackman, if you'd like to come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Nigel Jackman, um, also a resident from Kelvin Grove. I'd like to echo absolutely everything that Chris Rand has just said. I'd also like to say that there would be a far bigger representation from the residents of Kelvin Grove than you will see amongst the audience tonight. And I think that's due to a number of late and unforeseen commitments that people have um, found beyond their control. And partly, I think, the late notice that we had of, of this meeting taking place, which meant people couldn't, couldn't attend. But um, I can tell you that the whole of the road is united in opposition to this proposal as it stands. And I think what Chris has said about the size of the development is largely key to it. It's such a big development in the sense that it's going to... Um, provide for over 70, 76 residents. I would imagine that there could be staff um, in attendance of up to, a, well, the staff in overall requirements could be in the order of about 100 people, professional supports and other staff. Um, the 
The development, in our opinion, is opportunist. We've got five perfectly good residential properties on this site. All the owners, I understand, have been made a very attractive offer to um, sell the properties to the developer, uh, making it feasible. Um, but um, it, it's not the only place on God's earth where this development could take place. It's not the only place in Chessington either. And it just seems that um, the site, in many ways, is un totally unsuitable given the <coughs> size of the proposal and that it will be achieved by raping and vandalising Kelvin Grove. The, um, what is it now, west, at uh, the northern um, boundary, running along Kelvin Grove, represents about a third of the length of the, of the road itself. So it's not something that's going to be tucked in and is going to be unobtrusive. And uh, we've talked about the number of parking spaces and provision that's going to be made, but uh, the whole, um, issue of, of parking and cars and, and disruption and, and disturbance is going to be quite considerable in our opinion. We live in a different world now, whereas not, we, not only do we have car drivers and visitors and residents coming and going, but everything seems to have moved online. So we have online shopping and there are vehicles up and down the road, up and down the road all the time. And at the top of the road particularly, where this, um, where this development is proposed, um, we only see um, congestion and, and problems um, uh, developing and extending. And um, I, from what we've seen here, the ingress is going to be on Hook Road. We understand the egress will be Kelvin Grove. Um, and why? Uh, because the site wouldn't be uh, feasible, practical without that. And it would only come at the cost of residents in our, in our road. So all those vehicles coming out of, of this uh, property are going to have to um, find their way out of a diff difficult exit there in, in many ways. You're very close to <coughs> the Hook roundabout. You've got three um, rows of traffic um, as you face out onto it. Um, we have our fun and games, and we've, uh, one or two of us have had collisions up there in, over the time that we've lived in Kelvin Grove. We don't want this extra traffic, and it's going to be incessant because... <coughs> Um, at any time in the working day, there's going to be staff um, movement of traffic, there's going to be deliveries, there's going to be um, uh, refuse and other, and, and there's going to be um, catering and etc. Um, supplies and sundries being delivered. Um, and at the weekends in particular, I imagine that there will be more um, residents, visitors than during the, during the other five days of the week. So all in all, traffic is a very, very big consideration. So I live at the bottom of the road, so I'm some distance from this, but traffic affects us all, um, and it's, it's not, not something that we, we want at all. Um, I was looking at the um, concerns that were raised um, through, um, in the objections. There's about 30 concerns. I don't agree with them all, um, but I can relate to uh, at least 16 of them. So there's a substantial body of objection here, and... Um, I can't believe that you would possibly discount all of those objections. And uh, I, I could talk for a lot longer, but I would just um, conclude by saying I hope as a, a committee you will um, vote against this, this proposal going ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. And I'll call for John Dixon, please. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is John Dixon, and my family are resident at the Hook Road end of Kelvin Grove, so right at the very top end. Um, likewise, I would like to echo what my fellow neighbours have raised already and hopefully add to 
those comments, as well as providing one or two other considerations also. I think with regard to the Hook Road, its junction with Yates of Spades and with Kelvin Grove and King Edward Drive, this is already a highly congested and, in my view, somewhat dangerous junction. On Hook Road, we already see what was conventionally two lanes of traffic being funneled now into three lanes as it approaches Hook Road roundabout. Very narrow lanes at that, particularly for buses and for commercial vehicles. We see school children from three schools in the immediate local vicinity navigating the pedestrian crossings, the zebra crossings, and we see frequently near misses, traffic jumping the pedestrian lights, traffic colliding, traffic ignoring the zebra crossings. It is a very dangerous area for young, unsupervised people. This development, in our view, has the potential to compound that situation. Commercial vehicles entering and exiting King Edward Drive, which is very narrow entrance to begin with, and to a lesser extent, Kelvin Grove, at angles for commercial vehicles especially that they're not designed to navigate. As I've said, will simply compound the problem that already exists. In Kelvin Grove, we're fortunate, as my colleagues have said, to enjoy a pleasant residential area. We're fortunate to still have children playing, supervised, in our street at weekends and quieter times. But even today, that is becoming more problematic due to the aforementioned commercial deliveries, home deliveries, etc., etc. With the addition of parking, we have suffered over the years with spillover parking from the cap in hand when it was operating. And that, in turn, created very dangerous situations within Kelvin Grove. It is the case that Kelvin Grove is narrow and it is not possible to park on both sides of Kelvin Grove and get a dust cart or commercial vehicle down there. A car, a van, small van, yes, but not a commercial vehicle. And because perhaps people are in a hurry these days and perhaps because the road is on an incline, traffic from vehicles that don't reside in that road race down there and race back up again. And with parking on one side of the road, let alone both sides of the road, that is going to create more blind spots, both for residents, for children, and pets for those who have them. This development has got danger and safety written all over it. And I would politely like people to remember that if and when the first incident happens as a result of this development. Privacy is a topic that has not been mentioned so far this evening. It is, however, a topic that potentially affects ourselves to the uh, northern side of the development and to our neighbours, immediate neighbours, on the opposite side of Kelvin Grove. The scale of the development has already been mentioned this evening, and frankly, it is totally out of keeping with the inner area. It is totally unnecessary in terms of the level of three storeys. It is not, despite what has been said, compatible with the surrounding area in our view. It is not appropriate to compare it with the parade of shops opposite. Furthermore, if one is to look at existing developments on the corner of, um, is it Oakcroft Road? I can't forgive me, I can't remember. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, 
which in part does have three stories. It is three stories where the third story is in the eaves, in the, in, in the picture of the roof. So to all intents and purposes, it appears as a two-story dwelling and the height does not begin to compare with that of this development, which is both unsightly, out of character, and an unnecessary intrusion on the privacy of residents who are in the immediate vicinity. Furthermore, this development is going to be running 24-7. One would suggest that there's going to be a ratio of staff to, uh, to residents of at least three to one, given that it's operating 24-7. That being the case, there will be over 200 staff, let alone visitors, coming and going in a 24-hour period. So again, I don't think the 24 Bicycle Act is quite going to do it, let alone the additional traffic that that will generate, the additional parking that is going to be required in our street, a street that can only accommodate parking on one side. We already have parking overflowing from Haydock on the other side of the roundabout and other roads within the area. I could carry on much further, but I think I've made my point, and I would encourage the Planning Committee to reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Dixon. Was there anyone else um, that wanted to make any points before we go to members? Mr Rob, would you like to come down? Yeah, good evening. Yeah, um, the first thing I'd like to do is like, um, do we really need this facility? Because um, at the moment, you can see double-decker buses have got adverts for the Star and Garter home because they can't can't fill the spaces at the Star and Garter. And last time I heard that the Amy Woodhouse had twelve places vacant at the Amy Woodhouse, so we're not filling the places we've got. So, uh, do we locally, do we really need this facility? Also. Um, my aged parent uh, who passed away this year, she was at a Star and Garter, and I would say the rooms in here are like hotel rooms. They're not care home rooms. You know, I did ask them when I, we had a, an online meeting with these people to go and look at the Star and Garter and have that sort of quality. And as you say, maybe if they reduced the size of it and had some more quality in size of rooms, it would be a different matter. But, uh, you know, this is an overdevelopment. Plus, the, um, the raft that's going to be built on, we've got a problem with surface water. Um, there's there's a, a culvert that runs from Elmcroft down Kelvin, and it overflows at the moment. With uh, all this concrete, it's going to be made worse. So, it's really, it's, it's the wrong type of development. It's totally incongruous, um, uh, design-wise. It's um, overdevelopment. I don't think it's going to be a quality home, not for the number of uh, bedrooms, for the size of development, and also the environmentally with the surface water and all that sort of thing, I think it's going to be more problems, plus all the parking issues they've talked about. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, I've got, I've got a bit sore. Thank you, Mr. Rob. Uh, to, to Mr. Rob. Thank you to everyone who's uh, come forward this evening. Um, I'm going to invite uh, members of the committee um, to ask questions or of, of the developer. Um, if you'd like to come forward, I don't know if anyone's got... I know I have. Um, has anyone got questions at all? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Chair. From the diagram, when I look at it, I see a very homogeneous area. But your design goes that way. Do you have graphic images of the impact on these areas, this area? 
because from my perspective, it is very dominant and overpowering when seen as part of this unit. So that's my first question. The impact on the road, which I think most of us who know the area well, knows that that traffic builds up from seven o'clock in the morning and going up towards the roundabout is incredibly heavy from, I'd say, 7.30 until 9. I would assume that that would conflict with your shifts, but just thinking of more traffic coming in there, and I'm assuming that people would have to go round to come in because it's a one-way system to get in, and that is just adding to that whole flow. So those are some of the factors that I'm concerned about. Would you like to come back on that? Yeah, come to you close in a minute. Yeah, just on sorry, uh, just on the first question. Do you mind showing us what what? what do you want to go and have a look at what? Yeah. What point of the plan? It's hard for us to see that. That's all. Can you see that? I think. I, I think. Oh, hopefully, this will answer the question. Is the? Are you talking about the site? The the orientation of the home on the. Basically, we, we took the view that the, the ribbon of, of existing development of the houses, the row of houses coming down fronting onto Hook Road was the right principle for the um, orientation for the home. It also has massive um, environmental benefits facing east and west. You don't want anything, fa you don't want any northern facing rooms for the care homes because the residents spend an awful lot of time in their homes with none of them drive or a, a lot of their, their it's 50% dementia and 50% high dependency is the proposal. Um, so it's very important the environment inside the room is light and bright and has access to natural light and sun and, and that's why the orientation of the building is, is the way it is. Um, but you probably want to do the parking and traffic. Yeah, just uh, just on the on the parking issue, the the named operator which we've got for this home is is Barchester. Now Barchester operates over 200 care homes throughout the UK, and Barchester are one of four operators who wanted to operate this home. So, in terms of demand, there is a substantial demand from operators for this home. Uh, in, in terms of bedroom sizes, then those care homes, modern day care homes, the average size do range from from sort of 70 to 75. So the new modern care homes with all the new uh, sort of isolation requirements, they have to be of a certain size. Now, just on the parking, none of the residents will have cars. So all the spaces for the care home will be for people who are visiting and senior staff. None of the staff have the ability to park on site. So the vast majority will be dropped off by people working, people, sorry. So, so people using public transport to get there, people, fa family, sort of brothers, sisters, mums and dads dropping workers off, and also, and also, and, and allow also. To, please allow them to finish. Now, can we, can we ask them? They gave you the respect. If we can do it, pass it back. Just let them finish what they're saying, and then we'll come back. Thank you. But if he talks rubbish, then he shouldn't be actually saying things like that because we all know that that is not true. But these are these are things we can take forward. But let's let's show them the respect. They showed you the respect, and so well they did during while you were speaking. So let's just give them the opportunity to speak back. That please. Yes. Yeah, so you. so this experience has come from uh, an operator who's operating, one of the top three operators in the UK, operating over 200 care homes and employing over 2,500 staff. So vast majority of staff will come via public transport and be dropped off by members of staff. These homes also operate their own minibus. So, it, it, so in terms of parking, they, they require very, very limited. Now, I understand that some people get care homes messed up with retirement homes where people are driving and they have the access to the car. This car, this home, half of the 
people in there will be dementia pa patients and half of the other people will be elderly frail. So they don't have access and don't need a car. There'll be a minibus on site to ferry them around if they need to go to certain places. So car parking is limited for a reason because it's not a requirement in terms of the site. Now, you, you touched on traffic at certain parts of the day. Now, as I say, the average age of people in a care home throughout the UK is, is 80, 80 plus. And most of the people who visit those don't do it within the times of peak traffic. So they're usually traveling to these homes, not between seven and nine and between five and seven. So they're traveling in the daytime where traffic isn't as busy. So the traffic from a care home doesn't interact with peak sort of traffic congestion, whereas if you had like residential, you'd the five houses which there at the moment, the vast majority of people living there will be traveling at commuter time. The people visiting this home will be visiting at different parts of the day. Now, on average, every resident will get a, will get a, a visit. Again, this is average throughout the UK, a couple of times a month from people on average. So there is limited car parking. For, we're not trying to limit the car parking because for a particular reason. It's limited because there's no requirement for car parking. So, and as I said, the, the certain peak times that the most of the, the vast majority of people who visit the care homes are usually over 50 and will not be at work and will then be held to, to, to visit the care homes at non-peak times. Thank you. I'll go to Margaret and then I'll come back to Christine. Thank you. Thank you for your responses. I would like to point out that some of us are still working quite a lot after 50, actually. <laughs> um, I've got two sort of groups of questions, really, one about the care home itself and one about uh, its site. One is, um, is this nursing or residential? It's going to be 50%. So 50% is going to be dementia, and then 50% will be elderly frail. Yes, so but is that nursing or is that residential? It's not nursing, it's residential. It's, uh, yeah. So it won't be a dual registered home. It yeah. will only be, yeah. It'll be residential yes, care that's home. that's right, yeah. Um, so there'll be, there'll be limited staff in terms of... There'll be no nursing staff there. So in terms of... Because obviously one of the questions are about members of staff there. Every home will employ an average of 70 full-time staff just 70, not 300, and that staff will be on a three-shift ratio. So at any one time, there's an average of about 20 staff on site. For 76 patients. Yes, that's right. And, and that's, set by, that's set by requirements yeah. in terms of law and et cetera. So. so I'm not clear how it reduces NHS costs, but we'll um, well, leave well, that to well, one side. I'm not clear yeah. how it would... You said it would reduce NHS costs. I'm yeah. not clear how that would happen, I, but anyway. Oh, well, if I did, I, I, I don't think... It helps in terms of, in, in terms of NHS costs. What, what it does is if you've got, say, 70 local people who, who are living in Chessington and then move into, what you've got, you've got doctors who will then have to... A lot of these people who will be in there will be requirements, some doctors. So what you find is that doctors will come and rather than doing 70 house runs and having to meet 70 houses, there's less strainers because they come and they meet everybody at the same time. So it's less requirements on local GPs because they're meeting all their patients. At not a single sure opportunity. Not necessarily sure that GPs look at it quite like that either, but okay. Are well, you well, aware of yeah, the... Yeah, um, I, I mean, that, that, that I, can, I can provide you with the facts that back up those statements no, that's if, fine. If, if you require those. But. No, thank you. Um, are you aware of the dementia care nursing home that's about to open in Surbiton in the new year with 80-plus beds plus Amy Woodgate, which is also local to Chessington? Um, how do you see this potential building fitting in with the provision that they make they're both do, will be or are dual registered yeah uh, i mean there's there's before we we look at these these homes as a, as a developer and frontier are one of the biggest care home operators developers in the uk and at any one time we're dealing with 50 or 
plus sites that we're very experienced. We do a lot of background in terms of looking at the numbers. Now, in Chessington, there's an undersupply of about 300 beds between 2022 and 2030. So, it, it, so there's an underrepresentation in terms of bed, and there's also a qualitative need as well. There hasn't been a new care home built, I think, since 2012 in terms of the new modern space. And with COVID, there's more requirements for isolation wards. And the old care homes, where there's, where there's lots of cellular rooms, aren't, aren't that great for infectious diseases and just a quality of care. So these, these care homes that we're building now are of a certain size for certain needs. And in Chessington, there's a requirement for over 300. And as I touched on previously, on this particular site, such is the need in Chessington, and I understand there's other care homes that have beds available, but sometimes that's down to the quality of the space and the kind of nursing, that we had four people who wanted to operate this home. What we've done is go with one of the best in the UK because we want to provide the best quality of accommodation and care and provide those much needed beds. So that will you provide, be providing respite care and daycare or will it just be residential? It's, it's, at the moment, they're planning for 50% uh, and they, no, they might, that might change and adapt. There may be a certain amount of local authority in there as well. It just depends as of when. It's, it's a bit early at, at, at the moment to make that call when we're only at sort of an outline application stage. Well, is there space in your building for <coughs> daycare and respite care? Yes, yes. <coughs> there is, so you yes. would be offering daycare and respite care? It, well, it depends on, the, uh, it depends on, the, on the, the residents you have at that particular time, so it depends who is in that care home at that particular time. Well, I'm talking about people who don't live there, but people who come in for the day or part of the day or people who live at home but who need no, care? No, 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 it's, it's going to be full-time. It's it's going, so there yeah, isn't full going time. to be respite care no, and daycare? No, there, would be, there no. would be space in, in, the, in the place, but it's not. It's people who are living there who won't be able to come in for the day. It's right. full-time. So, so, it's rest, so it's no respite care no respite, and no daycare? No, that's right, yeah. Thank you. Are there any gardens there? I couldn't really see. I could see just a stri small yeah. strip, but no, so, no significant um, outside space. There, there is, and uh, there, I'll hand over to Hugo in terms of the space but the, we, we put a lot of time and effort into the, the space and it's a especially with dementia care and it's having no sort of dead ends and having sensory space so we work with our landscape architect to design that space that's important because a lot of the residents spend a lot of time inside so as of when they you know we we they want the ability to go out and enjoy a nice space. And if you look at the, where we've set the building in terms of Hugo was on about the ribbon around the space, that we thought it important to provide the gardens at the back, but also at the front to create a sense of arrival. At the moment, you've got the, you've got the busy road, you've got the railings, and it's very harsh. And the proposal we're putting is to, is to put some landscaping back to help the site breathe, to make it look more attractive and just make it more welcoming for residents who are coming to then to live in the home. So, yeah, uh, Hugo, I don't know whether you want to add on anything about the gardens and the space that we're providing, but on, on average, it's, it's more than what sometimes we provide on other sites. Yeah, usually, as, as Damien suggested, when we get into the detailed stage, we get a landscape architect on board that will have a look specifically at the garden, but there's an 18-metre strip at the west of the building and around and it carries around the front they will be split into sensory gardens generally um, and also a circular route around the building was quite often they needed their residents need some assistance moving around and we found the scent or well, um, research it says that the sensory gardens give the um the residents the variety and a bit of some interest other than their room so it's the landscaping is extremely important, the quality of the landscaping. I think it's just worth adding that, you know, this is a, an outline yeah. scheme and, and the landscape proposals will be developed, but it, I think he goes touched on it, but it is a very well-researched re point and, and all the schemes that Frontier are bringing forward provide for this really detailed level of, of external landscaping that does provide that mixture and it is very, very important to the schemes. Thank you, that indeed. Um, I... I think I heard you say that you're intending to realign Kelvin Grove. Can you just explain that? Yeah, well, you carry on if you want to, yeah. 
Yeah, it's just that at the, at the present time, Kelvin um, King Edward's Drive is is very close to Hook. There's a small well, boundary. I know it, I know it yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So what our proposals we were hoping to do was to push King Edward's Drive into the site a little bit further to allow us to put some landscaping along the front on adjacent to Hook Road, but also widen the pedestrian route so that it becomes a bit of a nicer environment for pedestrians to walk along that frontage rather than being pushed up against what's quite a harsh environment on the Hook Road. And that will enhance that, hopefully, with some landscaping, some trees, effectively, to, to create cover and shade. Yeah, and I think just... just oh, there, oops, sorry, there, there is an existing access from Kelvin Grove at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we, we're not looking to break a new access into Kelvin Grove. We're, 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 we're looking to... We're looking to move it or realign it slightly. We're not making it any bigger. There is access off Hook Road. You turn into Calvin Grove and, and then you obviously you know it and you turn left straight away. So we're not looking to add any further access or egress onto Calvin Grove other than what we're just looking to slightly realign it. Can I just um, ask for clarity on that? Because actually when, on your designs, it shows that you're having the um, access in through one end of King of King Edward's Drive yeah. and with the egress out of Kelvin, whereas at the moment you come into it's on the you come in on to the left hand mm -hmm. side. So you are going to, the design shows that you are actually going to be coming in through the other end of King Edward's Drive. Yeah, what I, what I'm saying is all that at the moment there is access from King Edward's Drive into Kelvin Grove. Yeah. That isn't that isn't going to change the direction of flow of traffic, maybe, but there's no additional points of egress or access onto Kelvin Grove from King Ed from King Edward's Drive. I'm not that on the How do you mean? The plans show that as you come down Hook Road. Yeah. You turn left into King Edward's Drive. Are we talking about presently? Pre yes. No, your no. plans. Currently, you'd go down to Kelvin and then turn in. Yeah. But then you go out the other way because you, you're telling me that you're realigning Kelvin Grove yeah. slightly. No, no, uh, so, it's well, it's realigning King, King Edward's, Edward's onto yeah. the, the, but King. the access onto, King, onto Kelvin Grove. Yeah. But then you've got the egress because you've got this one way system. Yeah. But that's not shown. That's what there, what's not on very the clear. plan. There's, there's arrows showing the direction of traffic through the site. If you if you go up to the plan, there's there's plans showing. What we're saying is we're not putting additional. we're not putting additional. You, you don't know what you're talking about. There, there is a, a, an exit on breaking into Kelvin Grove. You've shown us it tonight. You don't know. We're, we're we're not disagreeing. What we're saying is what we're saying is. There is an existing access from King Edward's Drive to Shh, King Edward's... Can we let the gentleman finish, speak. please? From King Edward's Drive. What we're saying is we're not putting additional ones in. We're slightly moving that. So there's not going to be additional access onto Kelvin Grove. There's still going to be one from the site onto Kelvin Grove. What I don't know whether... But one from it, King Edward's at the other side of the yes, site. Yes, where the other site is, that stays where it is at the moment. So that stays static. In order to accommodate your one-way which, system. Which is where almost outside the park or the, the open area. So mm. that one stays as it is at the moment. On, yeah, I was going to say, it'd be e easy if you... If you push to the next side. If you... I know. So if you if no if you if you if you carry on and I'll tell you which slide to stop. So so hold on if you go back one. So so what's happening? The red arrow the top that is your exit onto Kelvin Grove, which is not there at the moment. No one's disagreeing. No one's disagreeing with that. What we're saying we're what we're saying we're not putting any additional access onto there's one at the moment from King Edward's Drive to Kelvin Grove. What we're proposing is. One from King Edward's Drive to Kelvin Grove. So, if, if you, is it possible you can just flip on one slide, please? So are you making a new gap? No, the the way back, the the other way, please. So here. Yes. yes. Are you putting a new gap? Yes. 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 Y
no trees are being removed. So no, no so not so what? Really yeah, yeah, we've 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 said that we're realigning. Down our road. Yeah. No, yeah, but but the point is, we're making. We're not putting a new access onto Kelvin Grove. There's, exist, there's one there at the moment, and what we're doing is we're realigning it. We're just moving it. There's not going to be two onto Kelvin Grove. There's always there's, there's going to the be one. one. It's just, just going just further realigning down. it. That's all we're doing. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I, yeah. Sorry. This no. is what I was uh, I was asking was when you're on the Hook Road, when you're on the A243, yeah. and you're going towards the Ace of Spades, are you going to be putting in a new access? Into King Edward's Drive from the A243. A gap, a gap in the middle of the island. Yeah. In the middle. Can we go through the chair, yeah. please? No. Yeah. No, there's going to be no gap in the middle of the Hook Road. Okay. They can't. So. They can't. We're not proposing that we do. I think it's just worth also just, just referencing Transport for London have, have agreed to the proposal and do not raise any concerns. We're obviously, it, can I just, can I just, yeah, I'm just saying from a technical point of view in terms of trips, in terms of access, in terms of egress, in terms of safety, a road safety audit has been commissioned. Now, obviously, we will wait for the local highways authority to also respond, but there have been no current statutory objections to this proposal. So, so Transport for London have been a consultee and have responded and have raised no objections to the proposal. The discussions have been, we've had extensive discussions with Transport for London and as my colleague just said that they have no objections in principle to what we're proposing. And obviously we, we're still waiting some comments from Kingston Direct but uh, we're, we're in discussions and those comments are, are due shortly. But I'd like to reiterate that Transport London have been a consultee and have raised no objection okay. to our proposal. Thank and you. Can there we is a real to, to, yes. more to briefer because I think we're, we're, yeah. we're you know, taking a, a while. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I have got other comments and questions, but I think residents and other members have covered them. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your Thank answers. You. Thank you, Margaret. So I'll go back to Chris, as I said I would, and then on to Andrew. Thank you. When I spoke earlier, I wasn't actually talking about parking. I was talking about the flow of traffic. And I was thinking about your staff and shift times. And the shift times obviously come at the peak time. Now, you've raised a whole new question mark in my mind, because like Councillor Dunstone, I had thought you were going in from the south side and coming out at the north side. And that would be the cycle. And that would be the heavy congestion, which is basically from 7 till 9 in the morning, which is extremely heavy. Now, you're saying, well, they don't drive that, but yes, they do get dropped off, either in your minibus or by private drivers, or they bring the bus, but the bus also gets held up. So that's what I was referring to. I'm now a lot more worried because I can actually see a greater flow of people saying, well, I'm not going to go into that traffic. I'm going to go into Kelvin Grove. I'll go around that circle and I'll drop them off there and come back out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I have serious concerns about that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Andrew. I preface my remarks by saying I didn't want to be unkind, but I find it incredible uh, that uh, one can say to us with, uh, that um, staff don't need car parking in broad brush terms because they're going to be picked, delivered by a minibus. Uh, the, the, I find that incredible, but the, the problem is anyway, you have a preferred partner, Barchester as it were, that may or may not be their policy, but Barchester might not be the occupiers of this building, or it could be disposed of in a certain space of time. The, my colleague, Margaret Thompson, asked about the use. Um, but when you're dealing with outline planning permission, you're talking about a use class order, you know, does it fit? So the, the, the nature of this home could vary either from day one as to what was intended or, or um, subsequently, so... Yeah, but we're applying for a C2. 
permission. So th- th- yeah. that will dictate that it can only be used for use classes within C2, which, which is includes some of the the uses my colleague raised with you, and you said no, it won't be that. Yes. Yeah. So okay, well. But 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 it can it it, it can't be. You, you said it could be used for other things. It will be no, have uh, a a planning per- permission for for care. Yes. And and that's what the building will provide care. But you you you've been putting it to us. It it, it was um fifty percent dementia, fifty percent residential. That, that no is nursing. that is that is. That is the attention from the operator. At this moment of time. A- absolutely, yeah. The yes. prospective operator, we don't know he's going to be, be the operator, do we? Yeah, he... the, 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 you can't do a planning permission personal no. to a particular no, operator. Precisely. Yeah. precisely. A- and uh, we've done a number of other uh, care homes with this operator. As I, as I said previously, they are one of the top operators in the UK, and they'd be more than happy to come along to uh, an event like this and, and talk to members of the community uh, and uh, members of any committee. Uh, I mean, they, they want to be part of the community. Where we open homes with yeah. them, they do put, become part of the community. There's inward investment of over three quarters of a million pounds a year from every yes. home to local services like laundries, to yes. landscaping uh, and other services provided to the, to the homes. There's also local jobs, there's 70 good local jobs, which are which are a requirement these days, uh, not to mention the, the lack of care home spaces, which is a requirement. There, there's a requirement for trees. 300. Can I ask you about trees? Sure. Uh, you rightly said TPO, we well, have no choice, TPOs have got to be honoured. But you, uh, you, you said we, the other trees will sort of, uh, I forget your formula of words, but broadly saying, well, We'll do what we can. They, they weren't your. I mean, um, it would seem to me in the present climate, trees are trees, TPOs are not. There yeah. should be full yeah. replenishment or so, replacement. So, yeah. So what we do is part of our process. It's an extensive process, and we and we 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 undertake and we've we've completed a tree server which identifies all the the quality of trees, and they're categorised from A to D. And uh, on top of that, there's also TPOs. So all the TPOs on the site will be retained. Uh, there was no question of ever taking any of those down. All the category A trees, where they can be, will be retained. And I think it's our policy on this site and all the others, uh, by the time the development's finished, that there will be more trees on site than what there are. Some trees do have a life, and they come to a certain you know, time where the poor quality and and they need to be removed. On this site, we're looking to protect absolutely every tree that we possibly can because it, it, it creates a sense of place. We don't want a big concrete sort of car park. We're trying to create a home here which is going to be homely for people to live in and getting rid of the trees would be nonsensical. So our plan is to create a, 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 a landscaped atmosphere which is accommodating and warm for people to live there because ultimately there will be 70-odd people who will be living there. So it's got to be nice. We want it to be nice and we will work with everybody to make sure it's nice, not just for us but also about local residents. Uh, you know, we, we're not, we, we understand the the residents' concern about car parking, and what I'm, what we're here today to try and to reaffirm them that our experience and experience from our operators are, on the face of it, it's not what they think it will be. Car parking is people visit at different times, not peak times. People, there, there are there are sort of shifts can where, I ask where you about people. Sorry, I think you're repeating yeah, can, things can again. Can I ask so you about go back. flooding? Yeah. There, there has been some history of flooding, I, th- I believe, in Kelvin Grove. Um, what assurances can you give uh, that this will not aggravate the prospect of more flooding? Bearing in mind you've got the residential properties at the moment with generous gardens absorbing a lot of moisture. Um, I have to be candid with you. Many of us in the south of the borough from that line have very little confidence in Thames Water Authorities due diligence so uh, it would be nice to tell us how you are very confident that this won't aggravate or create a flooding situation yeah i mean it's it's all as you know all part of the planning process and that's all being assessed by the statutory consultees as we speak now an outline drainage strategy has been provided as part of the application i haven't seen anything 
Well, we can provide. We can pre provide details. But not that's tonight. Been you can't. Pardon. Can you come through the chair, please, Andrew? So, um, so I apologise. A yeah. lot of the report, a lot of the stuff, we've only got the outline stuff here yes. tonight. So um, there will be things that will go to the planning committee with the full other bits and the other details. So they haven't come. You're absolutely right. But um, no, I mean, yeah. the, the, the point is, I mean, the point that I was trying to make was that, that you know, planning policy, you know, we, we can't propose something. Something cannot be recommended for approval by your planning officers unless it can be acceptably accommodated on the site without that adverse um, impact on drainage on the culvert. We, we appreciate the, the position and the, 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 the circumstances of the site, and that is all being assessed as part of the development. Now, we are, of course, at outline, and, you know, the detailed design will come forward, hopefully, later on in the process. But, you know, the, that is all being considered as, as part of the proposal. And your, as I say, your planning officers are, are considering all of that as, as part of the application determination process. My, my next question, King Edward Drive is being moved slightly to the west. <clears throat> uh, and I think you said you wanted to make it a more attractive pedestrian walk along the Hook Road. Presumably, th that uh, land you're surrendering will be vested in the highway authority, will it? Uh, so, so what we're proposing is obviously to to create a better sense of place, yes, right, yeah, to, yeah, to take yeah, the railings yeah. down, to make it a more yeah. attractive. Yeah. And the 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 primary reason for re realigning the road was to create this landscape ribbon, which is more attractive. So, anything that that it will will actually retain as highways land. Or if not, it, it, it'll be subject to a 278 agreement. But more than likely, it will be it will be remain as highways dedicated, whether it's landscaping or highways. Mr. Dixon raised uh, the question of the close proximity of the roundabout, the Ace of Spades roundabout. I mean, uh, I, I want to put it to you. I don't know if you've driven from the south to the north, as it were. But there are, there are three three um, lanes, but actually not those three lanes don't actually give room for three vehicles simultaneously. You have to negotiate. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me that for the the inevitable increased traffic, it's just going to create an enormous aggravation, an intolerable one. And you you said, um, listen carefully. You said, of course the people going to these sort of homes are outside of the, you didn't use the word rush hour, but the congested period. But yeah. that's a permanent <clears throat> congested place there. That, it gets no better. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of the, a lot of the resident to visitors are outside peak. People don't usually travel peak. We, we've done a traffic survey and th there is a net increase in trips of 13 in the morning and four in the evening. That's the net increase. You what? <laughs> in the so, peak hour. So there's 13, it, yeah. over in what's, what's there at the moment, additional yeah. trips, okay. and there's four in the evening. So th these sort of developments don't create the kind of traffic that other sort of types of development do create. A and we have done a, a transport assessment, uh, and again, that's been sent in to Transport for London and, and, obviously, uh, and obviously to Kensington... Kingston, sorry, Kingston. Uh, so they, they will assess that. And, and, and we have also done a... a uh, so we've done a road safety audit as well, to, because these, these things are important to us. You know, we, we understand residents and local people worried about a net increase in, in traffic. And what we're, what we're saying is our experience that, 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 that we, we undertake our our research and you know we can demonstrate that, that that net increase in peak hours isn't that much it's 13 additional trips in peak hours thank you i'm going to start tying up on the the, the questions now i know i've got a couple and i know um councillor thompson wanted to come in um so i've got a couple of questions my first one is is how does the minibus situation work with staffing um, with the staff, um, is it you're collecting from local train stations or local um, travel hubs? How is it working? Yeah, 
So there'll, there'll be there'll be pickup points depending on where the staff are. That, that what Barchester will do is that they'll they'll arrange for certain pickup points that residents will will meet at, and then that minibus will pick them up, and sorry, staff, and then will, they will bring them to the home, and, and that that just you know that helps with rather than having people go individually. That because people work on shifts, a lot of people arrive and leave at the same time. That it, it's that what Barchester and their experience have seen that having a minibus, and, and this happens on a lot of other sites that they have, that they go around the local community, pick up the workers, and bring them in on a minibus. Okay. Um, and my next question is regarding being a care home. There's an obvious <coughs> need for ambulances. Um, and if an ambulance was called to the care home, um, the likelihood is it would come from Kingston direction. Um, it would then have to cross the Ace of Spades, go up to Chessington, all the way around Chessington, within all the traffic, because you can't guarantee non-peak issues, um, all the way around Bridge Road roundabout to come all the way back down again. Um, has that been taken into consideration if you've not got nursing care on site? Yeah, I mean, on, on the site, we will have one dedicated space for, for, the, for the ambulance, but the, the location in terms of its proximity to hospitals and access to ambulances has been sort of reassessed by Barchester. They will send upwards of £25 million on this site, so they, they, they will be wanting to make sure that everything works uh, and obviously making sure that there's, there's good adequate access to ambulances within a certain time period is critical for their residents. So it's been assessed, the location has been assessed, and uh, it is within the requirements for them. So, yeah, it, it's something that has been looked at, and it is looked at by all their care homes throughout the UK. Okay, Margaret, did you want to come in? Sorry, and, and it would have been looked at as part of the transport assessment as well. I just want to make a couple of comments. I think most people aren't, are less concerned about the increase in traffic <coughs> movement, but much more increase, much more concerned about the safety of the traffic movements coming out of Kelvin Grove and having to, unless they want to go left at the roundabout, they're going to have to cross that lane to get into the centre lane or back up the A3. Um, people coming off the hook roundabout, off the ACE, and having to turn right into Kelvin Grove and then left. The potential for, um, the potential, I mean, it's a, it's a really <coughs> difficult junction anyway, as residents have said. Those of us who drive past it every day know how difficult it is. And the potential for, um, Collisions, just just for, just for so much um, difficulty for people driving in and out, turning right, turning left, people having to go all the way down to the um, bridge road roundabout in order to go back round again. And I do understand you've had traffic um, surveys and whatnot. I understand that that the council is yet to comment. <coughs> But I think most residents and most, well, most of us would be really concerned about that particular aspect of its location in terms of its traffic safety and speed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you want to take your seats, we'll just, um, if there's any other members got any comments at all that they'd like to make on the application before I summarise the list of points to refer to planning committee. The one thing we hadn't heard anything about was air quality, which, for the for the residents, um, anyway. I don't, um, can I, can I ask a question? I mean, reference has been made to Transport for London, and RBK's own highway authority. And I know it's outline planning permission, but that's the critical point, isn't it? Once you grant outline planning permission, then things are flowing. Um, it, it, it cries out for a comment from TFL and from our highways, the impact. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily be answering these questions. Why, why haven't we got a substantive document from both those agencies? I, 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 Barry, can I ask you to come in on that one, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. So given the nature of this process being a consultation item, the comments of all our consultees may not have arrived back at the authority yet, but we still want to get the application in front of you as a committee so you can provide your comments. I suppose if I was to distill it down, we want to have your unvarnished comments, 
not necessarily tinted or tainted by what other actors or agents may say. Okay. So we want you to be able to give us your comments without being hindered by what the Highways Authority may say. And it may be that some of the comments you've raised are very quickly addressed by the Highways Authority, but it's far better that we know them in their unvarnished form than don't know them at all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Chris. Yeah, I've just got one further point. I've heard the word care home, care home, care home. Are you not considering a nursing home? Because personally, I have qualms about elderly people coming to the stage of needing nursing and having to change home. And it may be that you're actually thinking in terms of that, but I think you've just been saying you won't have nursing staff on site. So I'd just like some clarification over that. Okay, we'd finish questions, but if one of you would like to come forward and, and talk into the microphone. Yeah, so, so at the moment, there, there is a plan uh, within the care to have half dementia, half elderly, frail care. But that, that is the strategy for that home from, from that operator at the moment. I understand that there's an urgent need for, for that type of sort of care, nursing care as well. But for that particular home... We're not saying that it won't be provided. It may well be at a later stage. But in terms of having an early strategy, the, the operator looking at what is provided locally in terms of care, critical care, dementia care, nursing care, there is an, Egypt, there is an urgent require, requirement locally, like I said, about 300 beds for more dementia and elderly frail at the moment. So that, that's sort of dictating where the operator is looking to operate that particular home in. But I, I, I totally agree that there is, a, there is a lack of care homes throughout the whole UK, you know, in terms of qualitative need as well. A lot of the care homes don't have en suite. So, you know, for the last 10 years, the whole industry is trying to take down the old homes and build these new to provide better environments, better, better living conditions for people, to, to, to be looked after later on in life. So it, it's, it's a journey which the industry is in to increase the quality and the amount and the provision of homes throughout the UK. And, uh, uh, we, you know, that, that's, that's what we're trying to do uh, and in conjunction with Barchester and other operators throughout the UK. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I will now sum up the comments um, and points to be referred to the planning committee. Um, so um, members of the public mentioned um, the height scale and I'm going to include mass within that because they're currently the, the five homes you've got the gaps in between and that will be um, that that will go if it's um, anything like that development. Um, the insufficient parking, um, I have made comments regarding, um, I've got on mind that, that uh, whilst I appreciate there might be a minibus, there is a PTAL rating of two um, in the area, um, which means um, the public transport um, is, is very poor um, and therefore and the reliance on um, vehicles being parked in neighbouring roads, particularly Kelvin and Elmcroft, um, would, in my opinion, be significant, particularly if you've got at least... We've got 20 members of staff on site. You only need half of those to drive, and you've got an issue around there. Um, so we've got parking um, on the surrounding roads. The removal of five good family size homes um, in a time when we have um, we don't have sufficient um, large family size homes in the borough um, and to remove those with the um, outside space is um, is a concern houses of some character well, there is uh, that yeah, so I'm yeah. getting on to the character. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the loss of five large size family homes, um, which are a particular character to the area. Um, so we've got... Um, it's an unsuitable site. We believe the highways... There's a highway safety issue 
coming out of Kelvin Grove onto the A243, going on to the Ace of Spades roundabout um, with uh, insufficient space for that to happen safely um, and with the um, amount of traffic currently on that road. So we've got um, that. Um, A243, highly congested and dangerous. We include that narrow lanes of the Ace of Spades. Um, the loss of privacy to the northern side of the development. Um, May I add light pollution, please? Yes, certainly. So light pollution. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Well, it's Councillor? just as too much damn light at the moment, but it gets much worse, particularly for the people in Kelvin Grove. If you have a, it's like a massive lantern, isn't it? Yes. A home like this. And bearing in mind it's a 24 hour operation. Um, I mean, I, I get, it's a hobby horse of mine, light pollution, but, but it seems the mood is with me. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that we got it, we got it for the right reason, yeah, so yeah. thank you, Councillor. Um, so, yeah, parking restricted. The, the other thing I wanted to comment is Kelvin Grove um, is not only the fact that you can't park on both sides of the road because of the large patches of green spaces, which are very much needed. Um, when you get down to the roundabout, it is very narrow around there. And you've only got to have a couple of cars parked on that roundabout and no one gets around it. So um, I just, the actual layout um, isn't um, conclusive to any more parking down there because people will take the opportunity of parking on that roundabout. Um, so what else have I got here? So I've got um, air quality concerns um, and then what else have I got on here? Flooding, because I've put it on here. TFL, now A243, um, over the last few years, we have had a massive number of burst water pipes and flooding on the A243. Um, so Thames Water, um, I'd be very dubious about what the Thames Water consultation is saying, because I don't think they've drilled, literally not drilled down enough, um, to that information, so um, I'd be concerned about the Thames water um, with the number of burst pipes we've had down there. My other concern is the ambulances getting to site. Um, that's a real worry for me, if, especially when Chessington World Adventures is open, um, with the increased traffic along there. Um, and mentioned is it a suitable site for a care home taking into account the high pollution in the area by being so close to the A3. Have I got any other comments that I've missed? Barry. Thank you Madam Chair. Uh, through you and through some very good questioning by fellow councillors, one thing that has uh, been highlighted to me is the little bit of confusion about how your property is envisaged to operate. I've heard care home. I've also heard what could be classified as specialist older person's accommodation, which isn't a C2 use. It is a C3 use. But you're saying 50% dementia, and then you're saying what sounds like specialist older person's care home, which wouldn't be a C2 use. It would be a sui generis or a mixed use. So through you, Chair, I think the applicant should really clarify, back with the planning authority, in some detail how you envisage this might operate. Because as Councillor Thompson highlighted, there may be some differences in, in how care is provided, people who work there, 24-hour care. Uh, there's lots of questions that have been exposed to me or highlighted to me that I think you need to come back to the planning authority with a robust answer. And then maybe we come back to members of this committee with further information on that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Much appreciated. Well okay, so I think that's... So we'll leave it with the, the applicant to come back with more information. Um, let's just get back into my notes. So I've got everything. So, I'll, um, so yes, so that's, if that's all agreed unanimously with those, those comments, we'll ask that to take them back. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming along, those who came along through Garden Kelvin Grove this evening. Um, you're welcome to leave, if you wish. You're very welcome. Very welcome.
Edwards Drive, not Kelvin Grove, the application. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I, I apologise. Yeah, King Edwards Drive, thank you very much indeed. Don't make any noise. <laughs> no. Right, thank you very much, everybody. So we'll go on to... Um, we have two planning applications uh, for decision um, this evening. Um, and I just want to add the, the quasi-judicial... Um, the, well, these applications will be under which is members of the public are reminded that the planning application process is constrained by the need to have regard to current planning policy at national, regional and local levels as well as other material planning considerations including case law precedent. The decision making process is often described as quasi-judicial because, and I can't even say it, I never get to say it properly, because local planning authorities have to act reasonably within the bounds of planning law and the above considerations are not free to determine planning applications simply because of the weight of public opinion. There is a registration process for residents and applicants wishing to participate on the planning applications that are considered by the committee members of the public who have registered to speak will be invited to come forward to the table in front of the public gallery at the appropriate point. So the first planning application we have this evening is for the Lidl Food Store, 64 to 78 Leatherhead Road, Chessington. Um, with the, um, which is the erection of side and front extensions to the food store building and alterations to permitted car park layout alongside other associated works. Okay, so I'm going to pass over to Barry when he's finished his lighting. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll pass over to Barry uh, to present the item. Thank you. And if councillors want to move on to the seats, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this first application is reference number uh, 21 oblique 02869 full, and it's for the little food store on Leatherhead Road, and it's for the erection of a side and front extensions to the food store building and alterations to the permitted car park. Uh, one thing that's important to start the presentation with is well, rather strange, is explaining what this application isn't for. This application is not for the demolition of the two dwellings which currently uh, uh, occupy positions next to the food store. Those dwellings were given well, permission to demolish those dwellings and extend the car park was refused by this council in 2016, I think, but was overturned by the planning inspector. The planning inspector gave permission for those dwellings to be removed. Work has commenced on the demolition or the permission that allows the demolition of those dwellings in the provision of the security gates and therefore those dwellings or the, the fate of those dwellings has been sealed and it's not something which is under consideration here this morning or this evening rather consideration is for alterations to the layout of the car park and for extensions to the store on screen now you see a 3d aerial image the store and associated residential accommodation and servicing areas will be very familiar to residents then we see the location plan, 
coming around to some photographs of the of the store as it's currently operating, and then some photographs showing some, showing some key features, um, uh, some important uh, trees in the gardens of Sussex Gardens, and then view into Siena Close, and then we see the site plan as existing, showing the store in a blue uh, tint on screen with car parking surrounding existing uh, 52 car parking spaces, 50 of which are for customers, two are for staff. Then we see a close-up of the store layout, which again will be very familiar to residents, and then some existing elevations to supplement those photographs we've already seen. On site now, we see what has been permitted by the inspectorate and what has commenced on site, and that is for the demolition of the two residential properties down here and the extension of the car park. This, has, this permission has been commenced through the provision of the security gates, which uh, residents might have noticed have been erected across the front entrance, as indicated on screen. So this application is for erection of extensions to the side and front of the building to provide space for increased staff welfare facilities, for a deposit return scheme, which uh, residents and councillors uh, may be familiar with, is for the return of uh, bottles all caught up in the new Environment Act, uh, which is passed through uh, both Houses of Parliament, and then for a bakery. Uh, here's some key statistics for the site. The site is partially within Flood Zone 2. There are three TPOs on site, none of which are affected by this proposal. The extensions have an a, uh, internal area of about 210 square metres. There are 76 proposed car parking spaces, which would comprise two fewer spaces than that permitted by the inspectorate. And that would comprise 63 standard spaces, four accessible disabled spaces, three parent and child spaces, two rapid electrical charging spaces, 14 passive spaces, and then four car parking spaces for staff use. There would be a significant increase in cycle provision, 42 short-stay cycle parking, and nine cycle parking spaces. Here on screen now, you see the proposed site plan with the only alteration, uh, really, that is discernible on this image is the foyer building extension. So this extension here, as indicated on screen, which comprises a foyer entrance and deposit return scheme facility, which outlined in purple, the bakery area, which is outlined in orange, and then storage areas to serve the bakery. Over here, you would see the extended staff welfare facilities, uh, comprising an a IT room and I think a small uh, staff area. Over here, you see the reconfigured car parking spaces with accessible parking spaces, as indicated, on screen, and then with uh, parent-child, guardian-child spaces and passive charging spaces and electrical charging rapid spaces all surrounding the site. Here we have that proposed store plan in greater detail showing the bakery, the storage for the bakery, the deposit return scheme, a new uh, increased foyer, and then the staff facilities as indicated on screen. And then we see the elevations of how this looks. This is the uh, elevation of the staff extension. And then we see some plans showing the increased sales area. Proposed landscaping plan, there is a requirement by way of condition for landscaping or a landscaping condition to be submitted that would secure uh, landscaping around the extended car park and acoustic uh, fencing and also for the protection of the protected trees on site. Uh, some late materials or by way of a, uh, an update. The Highways Authority haven't objected to the proposal. Uh, indeed, they acknowledge that uh, the application is primarily concerned with implementing an expansion of the store car park that's been allowed, or alterations to the car park that's been allowed by the previous appeal decision. There's no substantial increase in the size of the store, and they do not envisage any material increases in vehicular trips generation uh, as, as linked to the bakery or the deposit return scheme provisions. Uh, the Highways Authority welcome the increase in short-stay uh, cycle storage. They also welcome the increase in the uh, passive charging. And then they also do acknowledge, as is, as is acknowledged in the officer's report, the proposed car parking numbers would exceed the figures 
in the London plan. However, this was addressed by the inspectorate who highlighted, because of the poor public transport accessibility level of the site, that increase or exceeding the London plan standards was acceptable. This would be too fewer than the scheme which the inspector assessed. There's just a couple of late material uh, uh, conditions or three conditions that just need to be clarified. As part of the previous scheme that was permitted by the inspector and these conditions would ensure they are carried over, there was a requirement for those security gates to be installed. They are being installed or being installed and that first condition uh, would ensure that they are retained. Second is for the non-signalised sig non pedestrian crossing on Leatherhead Road to be provided. This was a requirement of the appeal scheme. Uh, this condition would ensure that it is provided in relation to this scheme. And then a condition about the rapid electrical charging vehicle points and 14 passive electrical charging vehicle points to be installed on site. Now, these are just details in case uh, members and residents weren't familiar with the non-signalised crossing, which is permitted by reason of the previous scheme. So uh, this uh, proposal does not deal with this non-signalised sig signalised crossing, however, it would ensure that it is provided. And this is an image of those entrance security gates which have already been provided on site. So the recommendation, um, Madam Chair, is for the application to be approved with the conditions as set out in the agenda, in, on the agenda papers and also as late material. Thank you. In a, in a moment, if I can go on to the next point yeah, and then yeah, we'll yeah. come off. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barry. We have two registered speakers on this item. Richard Ware has uh, registered to speak as an objection, objector this evening. We also have Harry Neal of Walsingham Planning registered to speak on behalf of the applicant. Uh, welcome to the meeting, Mr Ware. Good evening. Um, if you'd like to come forward to the committee with your comments, you're reminded you have five minutes to speak. We will let you know when you have one minute remaining and when your time is up. Is it on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Well, this to me seems again like another Barry Lomax stitch up. <clears throat> um, the reason I say this, this scheme, since they were realised there was problems on the A243 with traffic entering and exiting from the store, there was a meeting of all parties in 2014 to resolve the matter, which was basically as the scheme shown up there. Um, in seven years, what has been done is a pair of entrance gates. <clears throat> and those gates were done simply in order that they didn't lose the planning inspector's planning permission because they'd be out of time. Simple as that. How you can say that's actual fact, it's part of the demolition, is an absolute farce. And I hope the, I hope the councillors um, will not be fooled by it. So this is a nasty situation. They've cocked it up, and now they're, they're trying to recover the situation by using unfair methods. So the poor local residents have been had to enjoy a totally unwarranted, unwarranted period of delay. And one could say, by what appears to be an unconcerned attitude by both the council and Little. Mm. The roots of the, of the problem were set when Little were going through the initial planning process. I can take no credit for this, but those involved with planning for the CDR, CDRA at the time said at the outset that there was insufficient parking and that was ignored. There is no doubt that would have helped uh, considerably the extra 11 places which were required 
uh, under the regulations at that time would have helped with a lot of the problems that have subsequently occurred down the, the 243. Little made out that this store was really, you know, a bit of a, an expanded spa or a, or a Lundis, and that people were going to walk to it and shop with that type of store. That has not happened. Little got lucky. They became very popular, and everyone piled in, and it wasn't a local store. It was everyone in, mm. and has totally jammed up the area and caused a lot of discomfort to those living around it. And, and mm, that is the main problem. I'll just say it would be nice to have a Chesington, in Chesington, to have the first little local. Mm. It is very, it is the very antithesis of the new London plan to knock down houses to make way for car parking. And this is much greener too. There was to be a store for the locals, not the wider population. The loss of two family homes may seem small, but this type of property is becoming increasingly sparse, generally even in fatty developments, with the form which forms the bulk of the Kingston's new build. There is a great reluctance to build three bedroom flats. So we're, we're, we're knocking them down, we're losing them, and we're not getting them replaced. And that is a big demand for Kingston. There will now be 72 customers. There will now be 72 customer parking spaces instead of the current 52. But as far as we know, nobody has done a feasibility study to check whether this is a long-term fix. To get a proper feel for that, you have to consult the local residents who live in the area, 24/7, and know where the cars go, when they cannot get into the car park, and it is not home. <clears throat> They park on local residential streets. The current London standard for the store is just 29. Mm. That's what TV, T, T, uh, TFL have passed down to uh, Little. You've got one minute. That is obviously being contested, um, but I don't know the current state of play on that. My final, con my final real concern and it's all to do about with the, the, with the inspectors um, passing of the um, knocking down of the houses. Mm. And it was basically done on a recent council annual monitoring report and five-year housing supply briefing note would indicate an oversupply of housing until, 20, until 2022 to 2023. This carried significant weight in his decision to approve but is in a complete contrast to what we have been told all the time by our planners, that there is a housing, a five-year housing supply, and the Kingston's 2019 housing delivery test action plan. This indicates that Kingston, over a 10-year period, has under-delivered by almost 45% for the 10-year period 2007 to 2017. So sorry, what, you've reached your five minutes, sorry. We are not doing what, what the planner has has accepted as, as is being done and is complete, completely the reverse. Mm. Okay. Richard, thank you very much. I'd like to take your seat. Welcome to the meeting, Mr. Neil. Um, please, can you come down? Are you around? Thank you, Mr. Neil. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so, if you could uh, now address your address the committee with your comments. We remind you, you have five minutes to speak, and we'll let you know when you have one minute remaining and when your timing is up. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Henry Neal, and I'm the regional head of property for Lidl. Our Chessington store opened in 2011 and is a very popular local food shopping destination, with the consequence that its car park is often at capacity. This can lead to highway problems, including cars queuing on Leatherhead Road. 
Four years ago, we were granted planning consent on appeal to extend the car park by demolishing two houses, 76 and 78 Leatherhead Road, to provide a total of 78 car parking spaces, an increase of 26. Whilst we have carried out works sufficient to implement that planning consent, we have delayed demolishing the houses and constructing the car park extension pending approval of the current planning application. This is so that we can carry out all of the construction works in one go, which will mean less disruption and lead to the quicker delivery of an enhanced little store. The current application before you is for a modest increase in floor area of just under 16% to the existing store. Two extensions are proposed, which together with a slight reconfiguration of the already approved extended car park and other minor works will provide 210 square metres of additional floor space, an improved in-store bakery, a deposit return scheme room to enable our customers to recycle items such as bottles and cartons, etc., improved staff welfare provision, 51 cycle parking spaces, an increase of 39 compared to the existing already permitted pro proposal, and an increase of 10 passive electric vehicle charging spaces. Together with the already permitted car park extension, which under the current application will see the completed refurbishment result in 76 car parking spaces compared to the existing 52. The proposal will lead to a considerable enhancement for customers. While objections have been raised to the proposals by a number of local residents, those objections largely relate to the already consented car park extension, which your officers confirm has been implemented. The new store, in-store bakery and DRS room will not function as a destination in their own right and so will not attract additional trips to the store. Delivery of the current car parking extension will, however, address the existing car park capacity issue. The increase in cycle parking and passive electric vehicle charging spaces will enhance sustainability of the store. The side and front extensions proposed are small in scale and single storey. They are of a height, massing and design which is in keeping with the existing store. There will be no adverse impact on residential amenity from the application proposals. This includes from noise, loss of privacy, overlooking, loss of daylight or overshadowing. There will be no loss of existing trees and the proposal will provide an enhanced landscaping scheme for the site. Residential amenity will also be protected during the construction works through planning conditions, controlling hours of building work and a requirement for prior to approval by the Council of a Construction Management Plan. In conclusion, this application provides a modest extension to the existing Lidl store, which together with the already consented car park extension will lead to an enhancement for customers and staff and an overall improvement in the operation of the store. The application is fully in accordance with the development plan and there is no outstanding planning reasons why the scheme should not be approved in line with your officer's very clear recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Neil. Okay, so do there, um, any members of the committee have questions of clarification to the objector? Sure. Do, 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 I was going to ask Mr Lomax a question. Uh, we'll get to the uh, the questions there. If it's, if this is for the objector, so for Mr Ware. Do you have any questions for Mr Ware? Mr Ware, would you like to come and just take a seat? Actually, if, if he wants to stay if there, that's fine. To stay there and we can, pick, can quick... we pick it up on the microphone? I can repeat what... That's fine. Uh, Mr Ware, were you able to speak to any residents um, of the roads immediately adjacent to Little in when you wrote your objection? Yes, I went down and uh, I struck lucky. I struck Mr. Knight over the area. He's been there 30 years. Mm. And, uh, well, I, I the new newly built Sorry. house. I, I, I didn't mean those on Leatherhead Road. I meant the um, newly built houses that were constructed at the same sort of time as Little. The people who live immediately adjacent to the back and the side of the shop? Uh, it was just down the Leatherhead Road, so, I mean, he was... 
because the because the traffic stats back, I thought you know this this is a this is a yeah, but yes, but I I just meant the pe yes. Well, thank you, thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Nope. Do any um, members of the committee have any questions of clarification to the applicant? Yes, I do. Okay, thank yeah. you. Would you like to come forward? Just for clarity, you have five minutes. Uh, okay, in fact, I'll remind you that you have five minutes to speak, and I'll let you know when the uh, one minute remaining for any questions. Thank you. Probably it's the question I was going to put to Mr Lomax, but more appropriate perhaps to the applicant. Uh, it, it is open. There are the elements of this application are the um, reconfiguration of the car park with the question of the spaces, the behind uh, the staff extension, facility extension, the um, sort of amendment to the canopy and foyer, and then there's the three elements: the recycling, the bakery, and the bakery food and related things. That's a fair summary. You, it, it was open to you to put in three or four planning applications for each particular element. Uh, you're presenting the council in considering this. If there's one element in your planning application which they would find inappropriate or repugnant, they're faced with turning down your application or, or them, them fudging it. Do, do, uh, what, why didn't you put in separate planning applications for the separate elements? So I think in, in answer to that question, the application that we've put in, we don't consider any of the, the, the items within the application to be contentious. Um, oh, you don't. Oh. In terms of uh, the... So where you mentioned the, the DRS, the deposit return scheme, yeah. the bakery, and the enhanced lobby, they are all linked to one another. They are part of, they will happen as one development. The structural works which will take place in the roof, it's all, it's all the part of the same development for that element. Um, for example, the lobby, which is being increased, that serves as the lobby for the DRS room. And then the DRS room feeds on to the bakery extension. So that's why those elements need to be coupled together. Now, as a result of doing those alterations to that side elevation of the store, that is what has triggered the need to reconfigure an element of the car parking because of the impact that that side extension has on the, um, uh, on the, the, the existing, or sorry, the, the recently consented uh, car park consent. So the final element uh, of works which is happening and which is being included within this application is the very, very minor alterations at the front right-hand side of the store, which is a small adjustment to the uh, welfare area, which, as Mr Lomax pointed out, includes an IT room. Now, that IT room... Part of the need for that is linked to the DRS room. So whilst you may look at them and think they're independent, they are all intrinsically linked. Thank you, Mr. Neil. Christine, did you want to come in? I just noticed from the car park schemes, you've got four disabled bays currently, and you will have four in the new plan, although there's an additional number of car parking spaces. You've allowed additional car parking spaces for staff. I'm just finding this a little bit of an anomaly that there's no increase for the disabled. I've got a feeling um, it's the same for the family parking that is being kept at the status quo. Is, that, is there any rationale behind that? So the, the quota of... Uh, parent and child spaces and the quota of disabled spaces has remained the same as per the planning consent that was granted at appeal. So we haven't varied that element. What we have done, however, is gone beyond that to provide a greater number of electric vehicle charging spaces as, as time has, has gone on since that consent. There is more of a, an onus and an emphasis on the, on the, the EVCs, and that's why that, that has changed in that area. 
and with regard to the staff, um, uh, there was the, the opportunity to provide more staff spaces so as to not take up more customer spaces. You've may I just 22 ask, seconds. May I just ask, one of the things Mr Lomax referred to was the need for a crossing to the bus stop from outside. Now, I see that you've put the security gates in. Why was this not the top priority <coughs> that you went for? <coughs> Quickly. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> Because of the the impact on on, on the, the sort of highway, it makes it made sense um, in terms of our to, to do that at the same time as the rest of the construction. So minimising any disruption uh, and utilising the, uh, the the main contractors that we'll have on site okay, with thank the remainder you very of much. the work. Unfortunately, Ed, we'll have to stop that there because that's over five minutes. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Neil. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll. Um, I'll pass over to Barry. Um, have you? Oh, that's fine. It's gone on. Uh, to present many material planning considerations and address where are necessary issues raised during that public speaking at all. Is there anything you wanted to come back on? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, only a, a couple of points, maybe just to uh, re-emphasise some of the points I made initially. And that was the point about the dwellings. We do not support the loss of the dwellings. We refused the loss of the dwellings in 2016. Unfortunately, the planning inspector overturned the wishes of this authority and gave permission for the dwellings to be uh, demolished. Uh, we are not in a position to revisit that decision, even though I still fundamentally consider that decision to be incorrect. But it is a, it is a decision which is highly persuasive, if not binding. Uh, so that's the first point. Um, second uh, point to make is, of course, one of the greatest concerns residents have with Lidl is the impact the parking has on the Leatherhead Road. Uh, this application, and well, it's it, the application that went to the inspectorate in 2016 and the one that uh, we have now in front of us, does go some way to help alleviate those concerns. It creates a, an in uh, you go in, you have to turn left into a, a, a space where you go round and then back out in a different direction. It provides extra space so as to remove vehicles that may find themselves having to park on the Leatherhead Road to get into the site, which is a benefit of this scheme. Um, I've got nothing further to add, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Has anyone got any questions rather than before we go over to um, debate? Has anyone got any further questions for Barry at all? Okay, thank you. So I'll now move the recommendations as set out in the agenda. We can't take them from the floor, I'm afraid we're under planning, planning um, regulation, but not allowed to, sorry. We, we will ask that question, we can ask that question, so that's absolutely fine. Um, I think it was on the presentation. Um, but um, if you are able to show Barry from the presentation, that would be helpful. An increase in delivery lorries as well. This okay, well, this is, uh, you know, this is not a question and answer. I'm sorry. This is a planning committee. Thank you. There's no proposed uh, increase in delivery lorries. You said that last time. You said Thank you. So it's, it's important to note that this is permitted. This is what is part of the scheme that's been approved. We're just seeking to ensure it's delivered. The pedestrian access is at this point here. Little store access. Pedestrian access. Oh, so it's further up the road from the, before you get to the... Consumer. So this is, this is the access point here, Madam Chair. And whilst we're not here to assess whether this is suitable or acceptable, because that decision has been made by the inspectorate, this is just something that will be delivered as part of this scheme. No, wasn't, so here is the thought. scheme, here access to live at this point, I pedestrian see. at this point. Thank you, thank That's you Barry. Okay, so um, <coughs> as I say, um, 
I actually do, um, I'll make, sorry, I'll move this now from the chair. Um, I move the recommendations as set out in the agenda. Is that seconded, please? Anyone seconded? Thank you, Councillor Thompson. So I will now open up the matter to debate for members. Um, so has anyone got anything? Yes, yes. Councillor McKinley. I think this application should be rejected, and let me explain why I think that. First of all, uh, the original plan of permission was granted in the face of opposition, I think, both by RBK and by residents. With full knowledge and with full consent, Little uh, pressed ahead, and they obtained their plan of permission. And they subsequently also got in their pocket the planning permission which was granted by the inspector on appeal for the, uh, the, the two properties, the two houses. I think there should be a discipline that, um, say, with full knowledge and full consent, they went ahead in this, they'd done their development, and they should be constrained by that. There's the Heathrow argument, i.e., when you, know, you have a, a, an airstrip and you want a, a, a terminal, and you have a terminal and you want a, a, one more airstrip and then you have another terminal and in a small way this is what I fear here is that um, there'll be this gradual uh, erosion uh, and new applications put in I mean Mr the gentleman from Little used the phrase um, modest extension of the, uh, of the Little store but I think he also said it's 16 percent uh, I don't see that as modest, but it's the creep. It's the creep which is the real threat and should be resisted today. I want to also, my, my question about the why weren't there four separate planning applications, I, I want to invite colleagues to consider this. Um, the um, reconfiguration of the car parking doesn't in any way ameliorate the problems on the A243. If you're coming from the Mansfield Road roundabout and you want to turn into to Little, you've got to cross the carriageway. If you're exiting Little and you want to head towards Garrison Lane, you've got to cut across the carriageway. That's an enormous problem. There's nothing in the, this application which ameliorates the problem. The circulatory system might appeal and help uh, um, customers, additional customers, it has to be said, so additional car movements, but it doesn't ameliorate the real problem on the A243. The second point is um, we're told uh, that uh, one of the substantial parts of this application relates to recycling, and it would be argued, and I would accept, that Parliament has or is about now putting new obligations on um, uh, uh, shops such as this to provide for recycling. So I acknowledge that. But, you know, bakery has been discovered 6,500 years ago. And in my view, the bakery extension should be con contained within the existing curtilage for which they have their, their development. That we shouldn't be uh, agreeing to this by stealth, increasing capacity, uh, because, as I say, I think it's a mistake, uh, and uh, the, the, the bakery could be done within the store. Um, instead of buying wetsuits and um, garden furniture, uh, they could do bakery in that space, which is uh, allocated. Um, the uh, the 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 electrical the the charging of cars. Of course, we all want the expansion of electrical points. But of course, uh, if you it, it, as this goes on, it will actually detain the customers within the store longer. Uh, and perfectly legitimate from Lidl because they, they're, the they're in business. They want to maximise the attendance of their customers in their store. Uh, this is another example of the creep which goes on. Um, the, uh, 
Well, I, I think that I've more or less exhausted I, what I wanted to say. I, I think that it's a big, big mistake to allow uh, people who have uh, fought and, and that they've achieved their store in the early 2000s, they've won at appeal in respect of the uh, those two residential properties, very sad, and RBK have got a good track record, they resisted that. But we shouldn't now, for some reason, allow the slippage because ne next time there will be another two houses and another minor extension. Um, so there we are, Madam Chairman. That's my view and um, what I would like colleagues to consider. Thank you, Andrew. I just, I meant to bring up earlier um, and um, please forgive me for not doing so. Um, there was a um, one of the, the sections of the car park that leads from the disabled bays to the entrance. Will there be some sort of crossing at that point? Because um, the, for a safety aspect for people with mobility issues, and that was one of the things I meant to ask, and I'm really sorry that I didn't. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it's not clear on the drawings whether it would be caught, or if members were minded, it could be caught by way of a planning condition. So if members were looking to approve this, this is internal works, doesn't involve any traffic management orders, it's how the space internal is laid out. This is something that Lidl could just do with the layout of their car park. So it is certainly achievable by way of a planning condition. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Barry. Does anyone else have any? Yes, Margaret. Thank you. Um, I'm just concerned about impact on residents. I don't know if we have any residents, uh, local residents here, but um, I'm just concerned about the impact on local residents, both during the uh, structural phase and also afterwards. Um, I do appreciate the point that it may not increase the number of um, visits to the store, etc. But um, I am just concerned about that extra noise, extra movement and so on and so forth. I'd just like to throw that in. However, I do understand that um, that we we may not like what's happened, but uh, they're probably not material planning considerations, are they, Barry? Please come in. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, unfortunately, the if your concerns relate to the extended car park and the impact that will have on residents or could have on residents uh, by increased usage, that is something which has been dealt with by the inspector. We are. In short, we are looking at here the extensions, whether they are acceptable, and any concern about how they may impact on neighbours during constructions could be controlled by a construction environmental management plan. And then we are seeing whether the reduction from the permitted scheme of 78 spaces to 76, two space reduction, will have an impact. Um, my advice would be that that wouldn't have an impact, but certainly if and your concerns are quite right on the construction of the extensions that could be controlled by a construction environmental management plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else want to come in? Did you want to come in at all? Chris? I can't find the exact figures right now, so I do apologise. I was concerned about the time that vehicles would have access to the grounds. And whereas part of it was quite reasonable, um, Monday to Saturday and then Sunday separately, for building it seemed to allow vehicles to go on much earlier, although building couldn't commence until 8 o'clock. I think I've got that correct, Barry. I've, I've got a feeling it was something like 5 o'clock. That's why I, I, my eyebrows had gone up. And I do apologise because although I've got extensive notes, I can't find it quickly enough. Barry, if you'd like to come in. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If we could just go to the next question, and I'm just going to whiz through my agenda so I can find it. I know there's a condition about restricting delivery lorries from uh, entering. I'll just find out what the timing is. But if we go to the next question, I can find it. Andrew. If you look at page A24 of the of our bundle uh, at um, paragraph 54 it says transport for London and the council's highway officer have made no objection to the proposal 
but they haven't said anything. I mean, I, I, is it they, they, they're silent? Where's their report? If they sort of say there's, to the committee, there's no problem on the highway, well, we ought to see it in black and white. Uh, the way I read it is that they haven't commented, or, and I think we're entitled as decision makers to have a view of the both TFL and the council's highways officer on the impact of this proposal, which is designed to attract more customers, naturally, and from their point of view, legitimately, fully understand that. But we were entitled to know what the impact is on that A243. And what we, everyone in this room knows is that people coming from Mansfield Road roundabout wanting to turn into Liddles have to battle sometimes, increasing the risk of collisions, and people exiting to the south in direction of Garrison Lane, Morden Rushit, have got this the, 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 the similar problem. Uh, the other matter, chairperson, is the suggestion that somehow there's a, a need to expand the facilities of this store. People in Morden Rushit go to Epsom and Leatherhead. Uh, we've got our, our convenience store at, um, uh, at the BP garage. The Hook Parade has got Sainsbury's and Tesco's. Chessington Parade has got Sainsbury's. Uh, Halton is nearby. The big, big supermarket at Tesco's in Kiln Lane, Epsom is nearby. We are well provided for, and we've got little, which we appreciate. It's there. But it's not an argument to increase its capacity and grant this permission for a variety of things, some of which might not make us lie awake at night at thinking about it, like the, the staff extension, but the, the provision down the what must be the south um, side of, of, of the property uh, facing the existing car park, that is something with those three elements, the recycling, understand that, but the bakery and the bakery store are unnecessary, and in my view, this application should fail on that ground alone, if not on others. Thank you. Barry, did you want to come back in on that one? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, first question from Councillor Stewart. It is a, a no vehicles to be in the car park uh, before 5am. So this would be um, if a bakery vehicle or another vehicle would drop off in the car park but wouldn't be able to, to do anything other than wait in the car park. There'd be no operations. So that is captured. I'm just seeing whether this was included or addressed by the inspector and it wasn't so uh, th th this is a you know a, a people not be able to work but cars being parked there now this is something that members can take a view on and, and discuss uh, turning to councillor mckinley's uh, comments now the core strategy does I does identify Chessington and south of the borough of has having a deficiency in convenient good stores and if you are in the farthest reach of south of the borough if you're in Malden Rushit and you wanted to do a weekly shop uh, you are either having to go out of borough which is not necessarily a sustainable solution or you may have to go to the petrol station as you say which is you know it's a very good um, top-up shop but expensive and you know a, a a discount store like Little, which what it purports to be, does offer cheap foods to or cheaper food, cheaper quality food. I'm not here to sell Little products, but to residents. So there is a there is an identified deficiency in convenience goods in the core strategy. This would address address that. So, uh, with regards to uh, Councillor Stewart's point, five a.m. and that, that's something we can discuss and see you know, how members take to that. With regards to the store providing extra services, it's an extra service to the community. Uh, we do not consider, as officers or with our highway colleagues, that having a bakery will increase traffic or will become, won't make this suddenly a destination place, but it would help expand services for residents. Although Councillor McKinley's points are, are very well made and you know, are very are good to be made. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. As a councillor who definitely lives closest to this store, I do, I'm very familiar with it. Believe it or not, I've never seen a bike park there. And looking at the new plans, we've got extensive gardens being replaced by bike racks. 
and I find that not conducive to good air pollution because the greenery at least absorbs some of the air pollution. And I can see that being a potential conflict because within this, there says there should be not, no conflict between cyclists and pedestrians. And yet the pavement in front of Liddles and to the south is shared space because there is no room for a cycle lane on the road. The road is too narrow. And so I can only see this exacerbating the conflict between cyclists and walkers. And I really find it reprehensible that we're losing so much green space. You'd like to come in, Barry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So if members, because of course this proposal does seek to increase cycle spaces, hence you seeing the, the turnover from garden space to cycling space. Now, there is a, a slight issue of chicken and egg here. So if, if you do not provide cycle spaces, people won't cycle to a supermarket. But if you do provide cycle spaces, you're quite right. They have to be provided in the right way so as not to cause conflict with pedestrians. So what members can do, if they were minded, is this can be controlled by condition. So there is a condition for landscaping, and members can then also condition that details and locations of cycle storage to be submitted and approved, and then make it very clear, as you, Councillor Stewart already has, saying that they would like to see cycle spaces in areas that are not currently uh, used for, for garden green space. And then that would certainly allow our highways officers and our landscape officer to work to achieve both ends. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Uh, did anyone else want to come in at all? Sorry. Did you want anyone else want to come in? Um, I just had um, a couple of comments. Well, first of all, with regards to the five o'clock start um, of when they can be on site, obviously the building above is residential, um, so um, I don't think they can currently have deliveries at that time or lorries turning up at that time in the morning. And I'd be, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I just found five extraordinary. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to try and tie those times in because, I mean, I don't think existing residents should be disadvantaged. Yes, Margaret. There was a considerable amount of discussion and discontent, uh, and rightly so, among residents, the ones that lived immediately above the lorry bays, because the original permission given to Little for lorry movements was not adhered to. Um, and that did cause a lot of disruption for residents. And I would be really very concerned if um, there were any extension to the times at which lorry movements are permitted, especially early in the morning. The problem, I, I understand um, the applicant's um, comment that they would only be allowed to wait in the car park. When lorries were waiting in the car park in the past or in the sheltered area, they were waiting with their... Um, with their engines running, and thereby, and therefore, the flats surrounding it and above it were um, were suffering from noise and fumes, and that was a, a real major issue for them. We can deal with that by terms in, in way by way of a condition. I understand, but I think we really ought to do that, and that's that's why I've asked on a couple of occasions if we have residents present or if any residents had raised objections because that was a considerable concern. It wasn't an objection when the um, permission was first given, but because because it appeared to be reasonably conditioned. But then my understanding, my memory isn't as good as it could be, but my understanding is that it was not adhered to, the timings were not adhered to. And then they went back and and the timing was extended, but much against residents and councillors' wishes. Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Councillor Thompson, you're correct. There, it, there certainly was an issue with uh, delivery drivers turning up playing music, um, keeping their engines running, not necessarily being very good neighbours. That was addressed uh, between the council enforcement team and Lidl and was improved. I'm not saying the problem has gone away altogether, although I haven't been made aware through my enforcement team of issues recently. But one thing, there are two issues at play here. The highways team and Transport for London would like if there are deliveries to be made early in the morning, for at least to be done whilst the roads are quieter and then parking up at a superstore before, um, before, um, before offloading the goods. So that's why we have the 5 a.m. start. Uh, there is also a condition about delivery timings. Now, it might be that 
um, you seek to strengthen that delivery condition. And that could be, uh, so prior to commencement of any development above ground level, the d- d- delivery and service plan should be submitted and approved. That's how it's written now. And that could be expanded to ensure um, uh, uh, contact within Lidl if there's any disturbance. So we have a direct point of contact, a, a review. So it could be that we have the servicing regime for 12 months and then we review it on an annual basis. So that could be if members were minded to approve something that we could delegate to the chair and to myself to come up with a suitably worded condition to strengthen it as much as possible to have a point of contact to have a review mechanism so we can see how it works and then have the control to intervene if we need to if it isn't working in the future i think that would be really important uh, given residents previous experience thank you So, I haven't had an answer to my question. Why haven't TFL? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, or, or, or TFL and or RBK come up with a, a commentary, as it were, saying that it's hunky-dory, or no, there are problems on the A243. You shouldn't be making a decision in the absence of um, such a, a report. And, and I deliberately use the word report because I would thought a thing like this, because it, it relates to the highway. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Barry, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, generally, these reports are written for a knowledgeable audience, i.e. members who have trained and, and understand the area, and aren't, as the courts would tell us, to be a disquisition of all legal principles and policies. They are to be a very a summary of the key pertinent Issues. So whilst I agree, sometimes it might be helpful, and I'll take away as a learning point to maybe provide some more information as background papers on these type of issues, but generally where we can be brief and where our highways authority, you know, some of our friends on the highways team um, would, you know, why use two words when they could use a thousand words? You know, they, they, we do have that issue situation. So I'll have a lot of words that ultimately say no objection and we will report no objection. One thing I did do, it it was on the presentation, a slightly greater version of our highway colleagues' comments. But with regards to TfL, it was a no objection comment, which is not unusual to get from our colleagues. But certainly, Councillor McKinley, I'll take that away and look at how we can strengthen that going forward. But again, a, a, a good point well made. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Chris. While we're talking about TfL, um, it must be about two years ago now that the then councillor Benford and myself and a resident in TfL met. And we were talking particularly about the problem on Saturdays and Sundays when people using littles get frustrated at the queue and will park on the red line because it's a single red line and they can do it. At that time, there was strong talk about wanting double double red lines because automatically this traffic should be going into the car park and not allowing that. I'd like to see a strengthening of the road restrictions, if possible, in negotiation with TfL to get those done, because it was definitely talked about as a possibility, and actually more than a possibility at the time, that it should be done for the sake of residents. Please, Barry. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, we couldn't here compel TfL to strengthen, but what we could do is, through this committee, certainly emphasise to TfL that we would like to work with them to strengthen those restrictions on the the Leatherhead Road and follow up from your meeting previously. So I can take away from this meeting a request through our highways team to see whether we can have further such meetings with TfL. Uh, And if members are, are minded to grant approval for this, on the basis of that, to see how those restrictions can be strengthened. But because it's not our road as a highways authority, we we wouldn't be able to compel the highways authority, in this case, which is TfL, to put those restrictions in place. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And, yeah, finally? I'd like to talk about the flat roof over the storage and the entrance and everything. It says very clearly in the plans that it should not be a garden area. However, is there any reason why it couldn't be a green roof area to mitigate against mitigate against pollution caused by the fumes of the cars in the car park because that will definitely impact on the residents above. Those flats are absolutely gorgeous up there Mm. and to have their 
environment seriously damaged by this would be a great shame. Would that be possible, Barry? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, so the restriction would prevent it being used as garden space in terms of people popping out there for a barbecue or, or whatnot, but certainly there's no reason why it couldn't look like a garden, if not, not be used as such, but look like such, and we could strengthen the condition to require that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, colleagues. So, um, some of the, so some of the, just to list the, the things that we've, um, we'd like to condition, or if this was to be um, approved. So we'd look at the disabled bay, uh, we'd want the disabled bay crossing. Um, the uh, uh, condition with regards to the construction in the environment with regards to the neighboring properties, the lorry movements, um, and uh, landscaping with the cycle storage in areas not of use, um, to have a review under 12 months and a direct contact to the store, um, the green roof, and um, to highlight with TfL to strengthen the highways and um, issues along there. Um, and I was on the committee that originally um, refused uh, the application, which was then uh, overturned by the inspectorate, um, which was a, a, a real, real disappointment. Um, and now looking at this, I'm, I'm, I am struggling with it, but because I can't find a strong enough reason to refuse it. Um, whilst I understand the concerns that have been put today, I don't feel we've got I personally don't feel that we've got anything that I can see would be a strong enough reason to refuse it. So I would be minded to permit. But um, has somebody got their microphone on? Um, so that's where I would be coming from. Councillor Thompson, did you want to come in? Yes, I mean, I can, I understand absolutely why people are unhappy about this, but uh, and Barry can correct me if I'm wrong, but I cannot see any planning. I can see lots of other reasons why we shouldn't accept it, but I can see no planning reason why we shouldn't accept it. And in that case, and it goes to appeal, we will lose because if the planning reasons are not adequate. May I, uh, may I have another? Yes, certainly. Um, I'd like to ask Mr Lomax, th this point... Um, which I summarise in my own lay layman's terms, what they have, they hold. Uh, but it doesn't mean ipso facto that you have to grant them another inch. Um, that's perfectly plausible in planning law, I assume, and planning policy. It's for them to advance the argument that there's some extraordinary, that there's a fresh case for them to have the bakery, the recycling, the new uh, canopy, the new staff store, the reconfigura reconfiguration of the, um, of the car park. It doesn't follow, because they've won their initial planning application, they won their application on the question of the two houses, why it, 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 there's no suggestion that they, 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 they won't have to persuade an inspector again. I mean, I, I, I can't see how, just because they've achieved that, it means that they'll be granted more. It's a quite genuine question. I mean... Barry, would you like to come back? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, no, it is, it is a, a good question. My response is, we would have to articulate and find planning reasons why, ultimately, Lidl having a bakery, a deposit return scheme, an extra area for their welfare, for their staff, has this benefit? Because what we can't do... Uh, well, we can identify, we think here, as a committee, there are disbenefits by providing extra car parking spaces because you're taking away two family homes. We can identify those as disbenefits, but we then have to directly look at the inspector's decision when the inspector said, but they're acceptable. Now, what we have to do, and uh, we, whilst we are not... We, we do not have the same um, process as the courts, where we're bound by a higher court into a lower court, so we're not bound by an inspector, but they are highly persuasive, and we would have to be able to demonstrate why we're going against the previous inspector in a very convincing way, because if we can't do that, and we got in front of another inspector, 
that would be grounds for acting as an unreasonable body and then we find ourselves with a possible cost against the council for acting unreasonably. And moreover, and I suspect slightly more important, is all the very important conditions that members of this committee have thought to add, if minded to approve, could very well be lost if this ended up in front of an inspector, where an inspector may decide, actually, I've got happy with the cycle storage where it is, I've got happy with no crossing for the accessible car parking spaces, the green roof, the extra delivery strengthening, and we could find ourselves in a much worse situation. So I wholly get Councillor McKinley's point, but it's how we have to balance that against the thoughts and wishes of the previous inspector, and how we, through this committee, can get as st a strong a position as possible and add those extra things that only you as members of the community can bring to the attention of the planning authority. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Chris. I agree with Councillor Thompson. There are many reasons sociologically to argue against this, but not on planning grounds. One of the things I want to see is the traffic off the A243 and into the car park so it can wait in the car park for car parking spaces and not foul up the traffic. So that really is a strong consideration for me in saying it enlarge the car park. Did you want to come back on that at all, Barry? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Only to say yes, this is what this application seeks to achieve, and uh, it will achieve it if members are managed to approve with these extra additions through conditions to strengthen it where we can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Um, so with that, I'll now move to vote on the matter. Um, if we can show that by a um, well, show of hands. So those in favour? Those against? That's one. Um, so that's, that's been passed. Thank you very much. Superstore. Now, this was the application when he first started was going to be a local store. So, all, everything uh, Councillor McKinley said, this creep, has it, it, already been shown by Lidl. They don't care about it. Thank you very much, Mr. Rob. Okay, we'll move on next to the next item of 115 Gilders Road, Chessington. There's uh, a change of use uh, of existing dental surgery, uh, class E, to uh, EE, -E, to a restaurant EB with associated extract ducting. And I will pass over to Barry Lomatz to present the item. Thank you. If... Thank you, Madam Chair. So the next application is at 115 Gilders Road, Chessington, and it's for a change of use of the existing dental surgery to a restaurant with associated extract ducting. This is the, def the uh, description of the development which has been put forward by the applicant, and for the reasons that will become plain in the presentation, uh, some of this is not uh, required in terms of doesn't require planning permission. There we are. <coughs> Sorry, my... There we are. So this is location plan. This is showing the application site outlined in red with two areas of land also owned by the owner outlined in blue uh, next door to the site. Here we see an aerial photograph showing uh, both sides of um, uh, Gilders Road parades, a uh, bird's eye view of the application site, and then some photographs. Uh, the, this side and the, the, the other side of the um, Gilders Road has been used for commercial uses, although they have diminished somewhat, but they have been used for commercial uses for a very long time. Here we see the existing floor plan, and then into existing elevations, and then we see the proposed floor plan uh, for restaurant use with five car parking spaces to the rear. That uh, uh, vehicular access again. And then see proposed elevations with the uh, extract ducting at the rear of the property. 
Uh, some key constraints, parking is uh, restricted in the area as shown on site, and with park bus stops shown on this plan to the right-hand side. And then we go into some slightly more detail. So the application, or the applicant, proposes a change of use of existing dental surgery use class E to a restaurant, also use class E. Uh, some residents may be aware, uh, councillors will be aware, that the government recently changed the use classes order so as to include a lot of commercial uses within use class E. To move around within use class E does not require permission. So in this case... Whilst the applicant has applied for the change of use, given the recent changes in planning legislation, a, a change of use from a use class E to another use class E wouldn't require permission, although the introduction of the extractor fan does require permission. Uh, the application proposes five on-site car, par on car parking spaces, four on-site customer cycle parking spaces, and four on-site staff cycle parking spaces and then extract ducting on the ground floor rearmost elevation. The uh, extractor fan uh, details have been presented to the council's environmental health officer and subject to conditions they are content that it would not pose amenity issues to nearby residential properties. The highways authority are content with regards to the parking and cycle parking and as such the application is recommended for approval. What is important to note here, of course, this is a parade of commercial units. This is a commercial unit suitable for a parade. It will add to, in officers' mind, the uh, variety of uh, provision of facilities within the immediate area. The dentist has been reprovided in close proximity to the site. I think the dentist is, is moved four or five doors uh, along from this current location. And therefore, the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Okay, so we have two registered speakers on this item. We have um, Mrs. Rachel Hubbard as registered to speak as an objector this evening. We also have the applicant, uh, Mr. Ramchandran Santharan, registered to speak in uh, support of the application. Mr. Santharan, I understand you wish your advisor to speak on your behalf, is that correct? Okay, so that would be Daz uh, Kataresu, thank you, uh, to speak on your behalf. So um, welcome to the, to the meeting, Mrs. Hubbard. Lovely, if you'd like to come forward and address the committee with your comments. You're reminded that you have five minutes to speak. We'll let you know when, I, when you have one minute remaining and when your time is up. Thank you very much, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Um, my name is Rochelle Hubbard and I'm a resident in Billockby Close. Um, there is an access road that runs alongside our houses um, that is at the rear of this property. <clears throat> Application was first sought in September and it was rejected. Um, there was no planning notice advertised and we were not aware of it. Um, it was then put in a second time. We were then made aware that there was a planning application. Again, no planning uh, notice was advertised um, by the people that were proposing it. Um, most recently, one of the um, uh, residents at number one attended the shop which the applicants um, own and was told that the, uh, it was not going ahead and they'd withdrawn it because it was too much um, hassle. So we were under the impression it was not being proceeded with until Friday when we all received emails notifying us of this. Um, the first thing I would like to talk about is the parking issues. Whilst I am aware that they are saying there are five parking spaces, um, it's a residential area with flats. Um, some are rented, some are um, purchased. And the vehicles that park at the rear of these flats will then be displaced if they are using it for the purposes of people who are uh, attending to eat meals. Um, we have issues around emergency access in the road. Um, I've been joined by half of the street here. There's only 12 houses in Billetley Close. Um, unfortunately, those that couldn't attend were elderly. Um, one is in hospital. He regularly has ambulances in the road and we have issues with people parking. Um, whilst there are commercial properties nearby, we have a fish and chip shop and I've lived in the area 46 years. Um, we've got the fish and chip shop. I remember it from my childhood. Um, the odours from that are registered as very high, and I'm aware that the odours registered with regards to Indian restaurants are classed as high, 
and obviously they're on opposing sides of the roundabout. Um, but with regards to the emergency access, we already have issues with the refuse trucks on a Tuesday coming down the road. Um, the residents of number one have had damage caused to their walls um, because you can't turn in. Um, the residents at number um, six have had damage to their vehicle where it was parked on the road within the allotted space because, again, there is no turning circle. Um, we have traffic issues as it is. There are approximately four marked bays outside um, on the roundabout uh, with time restrictions, and you have issues there with people not parking on them. They park on the double yellows. There is not enough... Um, uh, parking enforcement in relation to that. They park in the um, bus stop, and this is just in relation to the shop that's owned by the applicants, not what will be in place with the restaurant as well. We have parking issues in relation to the fish and chip shop as it is, and having a restaurant there is just going to compound the issues further. Um, as I said, double yellow lines. Um, I'm aware that the applicants also park at the rear of the property. At the moment, the village supermarket is enclosed and they have um, their refuse bins inside. Um, I understand from looking at the planning documentation that that enclosed area will be removed, um, at which point, where are they gonna park their vans? Um, people are constantly requiring access to the rear of that property, you have dog walkers, you have children, you have people using it as a cut through, um, and it's then going to become an issue. Um, our road is very quiet. Obviously, you know, you can imagine 12 houses is a cul-de-sac, everything echoes off it. It's a no-through road. We still get people coming in at speed and turning round. Um, and they do this on a regular basis. Um, the noise is horrific as it is, without the additional noise from the, the people that will be attending um, the restaurant. Um, and that's taken into account Deliveroo, mopeds. It's lovely to see that they're going to be supplying cycle racks, but I can't imagine anyone cycling there to, to, to get a takeaway. Um, I mean, it's a lovely offer, but, but I can't see that we will use it. Um, equally, deliveries. The delivery trucks already park on the bus lane in the double yellows. Is that what they're going to do, causing an obstruction? Um, they block off the um, dropped curbs for people to get onto the roundabout to cross the road. Um, you've got kids going to school. You've got St Mary's School not 100 yards away. One minute. And so, I need to talk quicker. Um, not 100 yards away. Um, the odour is of concern to us because we can still smell the fish and chip shop and that is further away than this Indian restaurant will be and we are downwind, for it. We're downwind of it. Rubbish, we have rats from the rubbish that spills out from the refuse area and that's concerning. Um, and equally, Indian restaurants, I've looked, within a two-mile radius, we have just under 20 Indian restaurants, both eaten and take away. What is the necessity to have another one on our doorstep when they are all so close nearby? There is no need for it whatsoever. Um, and the impact to the residents, I've seen everything go downhill. We used to have grocers, we used to have little cafes, and now it's takeaway restaurants. And I appreciate the pandemic has made this come out more because people are reliant on delivery and things being bought to the services. And we rely on their village shop, but we do not need yet another takeaway restaurant in the area. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to go back to your seat, thank you. So um, if um, Mr. Katharisu would like to come down and um, you will have five minutes to address the committee. Uh, we'll let you know again when you have one minute remaining and when your time is up. So if you'd like to come. Absolutely. I'm Ramachandran Sindhu, an applicant, and I've been running this business for over 15 years and uh, as a convenience store to the locals. And it's not really my decision to open a restaurant because of the dental property have moved away and it's become empty. Then for a while it was empty, then from the landlord, no, the leaseholder has let out, let out, and there somebody approached to open a same convenience store next to my store. And last 15 years, we can see from when we, when we started, there was no little, there's no, no stores in um, Roxy Lane, there's nothing in North Parade. So the competition has grown rapidly within the last 15 years. And I don't want another store next to me. 
it will kill my business and ruin the, and we are, I mean, we are only serving our community, a small area of people. There are a lot of green land behind there. So this is the only reason we have applied, I mean, we are asked our customers what could be appropriate to the next store. We have regular customers, locals come to the stores. And they have, I mean, persuaded us to a restaurant because there's, there are a restaurant in end of Roxy Lane. And uh, as I, uh, the lady said, there's, I know there's a restaurant in end of Roxy Lane, there's by the hook. But they all you had to drive to that restaurant. There's not walk by. And there are two pubs nearby for a family with the children or family to, to uh, not everybody want to go and sit in a pub to have a, to socialize, socializing. So this is what has been put to us, say there's no place here to families with children to come and have a drink, have some, I mean, this is not gonna be, we're not gonna be deliver who, or we're not aiming to mass production. I mean, the, even the tables are only 35 tables, uh, 35 chairs and se seven tables. So it's gonna be very local, I mean, local for, for the local people to come and sit down and enjoy their meal. And same time, I would be able to run my business and pay my um, um, rates. Then I'll be, you know, then my both business will be alive. If I don't take out this lease, then what is going to happen? Someone is going to come and open another convenience store, and it will be ruin both businesses. And that's what I'd like to say. Just, just to address on the health and safety issues of the parking. Parking, the old, old fibers are designed within the boundary of the um, property, so it's not coming out to the road or the uh, passage in there. That's one thing. So I don't, I, don't, I don't see, without being rude to her or anybody in that uh, road, I don't see any problem with that. Um, again, coming to the pest control, pest control will be adequately handled by latest technologies and um, as enforcement officer, uh, Bar Bar Mr. Bar Barry Lomax, uh, uh, I'm sure they, they, they'll be at the case all the time, how we, how we control the rubbish collections or uh, infestation or any issues, which we, we, would, we would try our best not to have it. And the, and, and the other thing she wrote is um, parking enforcements at the moment, the problem they're having. I don't think... The, it's, the restaurant is mainly going to be evening, and I don't think it will be a major issue because it's only with seven chairs, I mean seven tables, probably at the best of times, it'll be, five will be occupied at the best. And the study of what we have done, based on it, um, sit-in and deliveries, it'll be a 70-30. Uh, for delivery, 30%, sit-in sit -in, or eat-in customers, 70%. Um, and in terms of uh, smell or odor, odor one pollution. minute. In terms of odor, odor can be controlled by latest technologies. And uh, again, uh, Mr. Uh, Lomax can, um, uh, I'm sure, um, um, uh, our plan, uh, uh, Robert McBride, he could make it today. Um, uh, he would have gone into a bit more in uh, sort of technology side or data information. Um, so that that can that that can be controlled with conditions. Um, and also the noise, um, because uh, from my simple general understanding now, they've got latest dampers to control the noises and the filters to control the odors. Maybe the fish and chips, they would have had the permission a long time ago, so that was an address then, but it, it can be addressed in the conditions. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, if you'd like Thank to take your seat. Thank you. Do any members of the committee have any questions or clarifications of the objector? Yes, I'd like to ask Okay, certainly. Um, if yes. Good evening, Mrs. Hubbard. Um, you and I have similar recollections. Mm -hmm. I can recall at least two green grocers mm -hmm. on that street, an off license, yeah. a, a real off license, obviously the fish and chips shop. Post office. The post office mm -hmm. on the corner at 119. Yeah. And I remember the pre-dentist occupiers were 115. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if you do. Do you recall? Not off the top of my head. It was a tyre shop. Oh, yes, which it, is extended. Yeah, I believe, and I, yeah, I mean, I actually the... had used it and <laughs> for at least three decades it was occupied. Yeah. And when you used to, they didn't fit the tyres in the front street. You went round the back. Mm -hmm. It just seems to me that... And one of the problems here anyway mm -hmm. is you have to have grounds for refusal. It does seem to me that, that ho all that area mm -hmm. has been primarily shops. It was constructed as shops. Mm -hmm. There was, on this particular site, a tyre tire firm mm -hmm. which fitted around the back. Yeah. And um, in a sense, I wanted you to comment upon that because it seems to me... The, the history and the, the structures le lends itself to, to to this kind of application. Yeah. Pardon? In the daytime. In the daytime, not Sundays. In the daytime. Yeah. But not in the daytime. Mm. Sorry, they're, they're chipping in and I have no, no idea. No, I what take the point. Okay. <laughs> but I wanted to put it to you. That, yeah. Uh, and I think Mr Lomax has indicated to us there's limited uh, scope here. Mm -hmm. At uh, the rear, you mean limited scope for parking at the rear? No, limited scope for the uh, the use class. Uh, probably he'll help us later. But right. Uh, the, the the a restaurant there mm -hmm. is within the existing use classes order. Okay. So there has to be some overriding reason. Mm -hmm. Were the committee mindful to object? Okay. And I'm inviting you to sort of amplify upon that, bearing in mind okay. the history, yeah. both of the particular property mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, number of shops around there. So can you just clarify what your actual question is to... Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I suppose it's given a second opportunity to say why there's some overriding reason why it can't be granted. Um, Sorry, Mr. Rob. This is... Um, <laughs> No, that's fine. Um, so, um, as this gentleman said, you know, uh, back in the day, things were a lot different. You know, it, there was a bigger space. So the fitting of tyres at the rear of the premises, there would have been adequate, for prison, for, for, adequate provision for that. You now have the flats. They've extended. There are people living there. They have living areas at the back. They have their vehicles there. All of these things are going to be displaced and there will not be adequate parking for five vehicles at the rear. More importantly, you have the residents in the local area with the flats and you're going to have a, a procession of vehicles going along the dark um, alleyway. There's going to be noise. I understand they spoke about the noise level with regards to the pollution aspect. What about the noise level with regards to people coming in the road, to going down the alleyway, to deliveries, to day and night, to, you know, and, until it shuts? They mentioned it was somewhere for families to come. However, families with young children, somewhere to go? Well, my son eats at half past five. So I presume they'd be shutting at nine o'clock then, would they, if that's what their, their target audience is? Um, you know, it's... And I, and I appreciate, I go to their shop, I've gone to their shop for ages, my father used to go to their shop, all the residents do. They're very nice people. But you can't open a business on the basis of you don't want your business to be taken away by someone else moving next door and minute. completely disrupt everything. One minute, did you say? Yeah. Sorry. Um, you know, having spoken, I know we have spoken to them previously, and the reason we suggested opening a cafe perhaps next door, something more in keeping that the local residents would actually want. There is a lot of older people there. They don't necessarily want Indian takeaway. You know, you want support, you want baked items, things like that. And they turned around and said that their business was being taken away by Tesco's and Sainsbury's. So... Thank you. Did anyone else have a question quickly before we run out of time on this one? Nope. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Does anyone have a question for the applicants at all? Nope. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Barry, we'll now present the material planning considerations and address where necessary issues raised during public speaking. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, I think it, it, it is important to hammer down this issue of the use classes. A dentist falls within use class E 
a restaurant, a gym, a day nursery, a creche, a coffee bar, a cafe, a restaurant, a doctor's, state agent, hairdressers, all fall now within use class E. Now, whether we like it in this room or not, there's very little we can do about it because this is a matter for central government. They are all in the same use class. This property can move to a restaurant without us at this point in time saying yes or no. Again, whether we like it or we don't like it is somewhat immaterial because that power has been given by central government. We're here today to really look at the extractor fan at the back, which officers would say would actually go away some way to address the concerns with regards to air pollution and um, noise and smells. The use is covered by the General Permitted Development Order. I just think it's very important that we focus that in our minds that by approving this, you know, if members were minded to approve, they're not saying they're happy for this to be a restaurant, although that they may be happy. That's not a consideration. That's for central government. Uh, with regards to whether people, whether there's 20 Indian restaurants within two miles, there could be 120 restaurants within two miles. The planning system isn't here to assess competition between Indian restaurants like it's not to assess competition between any other type of business. That's a matter for, for the market. So um, just as a key consideration for members this evening is, unfortunately, the new changes to the use classes order, in particular the changes to use classes E, has made moves like this far easier and do not give the control that you might wish your local authority to have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. So um, I'll now move the recommendations as set out in the agenda report. Is that seconded, please? Yeah, yeah thank you. Councillor Stewart. Um, and I will now open up the matter for debate. Um, so next, yes, uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you. I mean, the extractor fan noise was my major concern on reading this application. Um, so can you just elucidate, Barry, explain how, how those things can be mitigated and what constraints we could put on, what conditions we could place to ensure that there is no increased noise or odour, um, cooking smells, which, which, which happen with any kind of restaurant. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we, we, we have conditions in the report, conditions that require a maintenance schedule for the extractor fan and the filters to be submitted to and approved in writing. And then we have a requirement for any plant or machinery, i.e. the extractor fans, to keep their noise levels to five decibels lower than existing background noise levels at any given time of operation. So that is, they need to be below the background noise levels. So if they are above the background noise levels, we then have the powers and authority to step in and to serve enforcement notices. So these conditions have gone through our colleagues in environmental health, and they have given us three conditions. The first one is one month, a schedule, as I said, cleaning a mention schedule for the extractor fan, because one of the reasons why smell uh, is comes from these extractor fans is because they're not cleaned and they're not maintained properly. So we have the requirement for a maintenance schedule. We have the five decibels below background noise levels to address noise from the plant and machinery. And then we have a condition that prior to the commencement of the development, the applicant shall submit a scheme detailing sound transmission reduction measures to be installed between the ground floor use and the first floor flat. So then to protect the amenities of the immediate neighbouring properties. So they are conditions that have come through our environmental health team to provide as much uh, safety and security as we can to protect the amenities of neighbours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Did anyone else have any questions at all? Um, very quickly. No site notice advertising the application. Is that true or is that because it was only for the extractor firm? Uh, thank you, Madam. That's true because there was no requirement to provide a site notice. There's only limited uh, occasions in planning when a site notice goes up. That is for major development, development that involves an environmental statement, a departure from a local plan, or one that involves an alteration to a public right of way. Uh, this development didn't trigger any of those needs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. And from my point of view, I, I worry. I mean, I know it is, um, you know, the class is, you, they can open a restaurant anyway. But I'm guessing that they will have to go through licensing committee, put a licensing application in for their hours of opening um, and alcohol license and, and anything like that. So that's, that will be controlled under licensing and not planning. Um, 
but one of my questions regarding the um, extractor fan is how often have we got some sort of maintenance check-in on the condition and who checks the checker? Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, what, so there will be a requirement for them to submit to us a maintenance schedule. And then um, the, the planning enforcement regime across the country is a reactive regime. If there is a complaint raised, we then have the details of the maintenance schedule they should be keeping. We then check for records that they have been keeping it properly. Our environmental health food hygiene team will check whether the extractor fan is being cleaned. And if not, and there is an issue with regards to um, the proposal being injurious to, to um, health or amenity, we can serve a stop notice and stop them operating. As can our friends in environmental health, it becomes an even greater danger. So there are provisions in place for the enforcement team to step in. Now, as I say, it is a reactive power because there are hundreds of takeaway. Well, uh, also another point I should make, this is not a takeaway, this is a restaurant. There may be ancillary takeaway sales, but it is predominantly a restaurant. There are hundreds of restaurants, so we can't go around as a planning enforcement team checking each restaurant or each shop. It's reactive, but then we do take action where we need to around the borough, have taken action and corrected problems where they exist. Thank you, Madam Chair. And can I just check, just for my own peace of mind, that um, if they decided, if the owners decided they wish to use Deliveroo or Uber, whichever um, distributor they were, or distributions they wanted to, would that have to go through committee, uh, licensing committee as well? I can't recall whether or not it does or whether they just are allowed to do it because that just worries me. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I can't speak for our friends in the licensing team, but I can say if this pr property becomes a takeaway, that is a material change of use of the land requiring a planning permission, uh, whether it re requires um, uh, licensing. Now, of course, one delivery cycle picking up one curry every week does not constitute a material change of use. There has to be a material change of use. And this does, you know, and as a planning authority, we have taken action. The problem, if it is a problem, if you Uber Eats and Deliveroo is a relatively new problem, you know, a product of uh, the pandemic, not, mo not solely, but it's been exacerbated by. We used to have problems with mopeds and pizza delivery shops where you'd have a, a takeaway with lots of pizza uh, mopeds outside. And where that has happened from a restaurant, we've taken action because it is a change of use of the land and it's been stopped. We would have the same safety net here if it became a problem, because of too many pickups, we would then say that it, tipped, it is tipped into takeaway and step in and say it needs to have a permission. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Have you? Okay. Anyone else got any questions or anything to add at all to the debate? No? Okay. Well, in that case, I'll um, move to a vote on the matter. This will be done by a show of hands. So those in favour, please. Reluctantly. That's four. So there's none against and none, no abstentions. Um, so that's passed. Thank you very much indeed. There's no urgent items authorised by the chair this evening. So I will close the meeting at 10.46. Thank you.